Yes, yes, I do.
Honourable Mr. Deepak Bhargobin, Minister of uh, Information Technology, Communication and Innovation. Honourable Sudhir Modu, Minister of uh, Blue Economy, Marine Resources and Fisheries. Dr. Kaviraj Suko, Chairperson of the Mauritius Research and Innovation Council. Professor Tishan Bauran, Executive Director of the Mauritius Research and Innovation Council. Dr. Rafael Aguida, Professor at the Surrey Space Center and uh, Principal Investigator of this uh, project, the NERES project. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, and also our online attendees, because uh, this workshop is being held uh, on a hybrid basis. Welcome to this whole day session today, where we will be discussing about the nearest project, which is an innovative project which uh, goes in line with the first Mauritian satellite. And uh, is uh, the title is a space-based maritime surveillance system for fisheries and uh, anomaly detection. This project is a collaboration between the Surrey Space Center in UK and the Mauritius Research and Innovation Council, and is supported by the UNDP under the Ocean Innovation Challenge. So um, we will have the uh, welcoming address of our executive director. And uh, so uh, without uh, further delay, let me please welcome our executive director, Professor Baron to uh, say a few welcoming notes. Thank you, uh, Vikram. Honorable Deepak Balgobin, Minister of Information, Technology, Communication and Innovation. Honorable Sudhir Modu, Minister of Blue Economy, Fishery, Blue Economy Marine Resources, Fisheries and Shipping. Mr. Ramesh Beku, Deputy Permanent Secretary of our Permanent Ministry, Dr. Kaviraj Sharma Sukon, Chairperson of EMRIC, Council Members of EMRIC, Professor Rafael Aguida, Principal Investigator, Surrey Space Center, University of Surrey, UK, Heads of Institutions, Distinguished Guests, Members of the Press, Students and Researchers, Ladies and Gentlemen. A warm welcome to all present in person today here and those following us through video conferencing. As you are aware, the Mauritius Research and Innovation Council joined the close circle of spacefaring countries for the launching of its first Mauritian satellite through the Kibokyu program organized by UNUSA and JAXA. This project has triggered our impetus for innovative projects that would sustain the country's ambition to develop its space agenda. Today, we are witnessing one of these projects, which entails to be a space-based maritime surveillance system for fisheries monitoring and anomaly detection. This project is known as the Nereus Project. This project is being conducted in collaboration with Surrey Space Center, University of Surrey, UK, and indeed financed by the UNDP. With the background of its objectives, we strongly believe that this project will be beneficial to the Republic of Mauritius. The team of a space unit at the MRIC will be involved in gathering existing data from the automatic identification system and vessel monitoring system that will be used by the project partners to develop and validate artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithm. Those algorithms will be the basis for fisheries monitoring and anomaly detection in the EEZ of the Republic of Mauritius. It is without saying but the success of this project relies also on the collaboration of the relevant Mauritian authorities. The MRIC team 
with a background of its expertise acquired through the MIRSAT initiative, will coordinate a process of liaising and will engage and leverage on the resources of the various local authorities and stakeholders to churn meaningful data over a project. Ladies and gentlemen, the main outcome of the NERIUS project is the development of a tool for the detection of anomalies in satellite data that could be related directly to IUU fishing activities. The project will also allow the MOIC to be involved in training of the relevant stakeholders in the use of IUU detection tool, which will better equip them in monitoring our EEZ and also enhance the national efforts to prevent, deter, and eliminate IUU fishing. I will end by wishing you all a very fruitful deliberation during this workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Baran. I will now uh, please invite uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Suko for his uh, address. Honorable Balgobin Minister, Honorable Madhu Minister, Dr. Gida from Surrey Space Center, Professor Bauran, Executive Director of MRIC, Mr. Biku, DPS, colleagues, chairperson, directors, good morning. It's indeed a great pleasure to be here with you for this important project. As you know, MRIC since 2020, we have decided to change. The act has been changed and we have now added additional components to what we do. As you can see, the current project, all the staff of the MRIC are directly involved. So under the able leadership of the Honorable Balgobi, the act has been changed, and this gives us additional leverage to be able to do more in this field. MRIC has been working with everybody, starting from the one who has an idea to develop the incubation stage, and to the corporates who decide to embark on innovative projects. So. We have been supporting everybody. And the last event we had, Les Assises de la Recherche, involved all the stakeholders because we wanted to know from the host's mouth what we should be doing, where the shoe is pinching in order to develop an innovation and research strategy for the country. And today's project, is indeed an important one. I've always been saying, you know, space technology is not something that can happen overnight. It requires a lot of dedication, a lot of patience, and above all, a lot of investment. We have been, since the time we set up the space unit at MRIC, we have been involved in several projects with India, with Israel, now with Surrey, and next week we'll have another project coming. So we are ensuring that the space unit develops and helps Mauritius in, in making Mauritius an innovative nation. Today's project, take it from a vegetarian, purely vegetarian, that fishing is very important. And sometimes you have to go very far to see what is close to you. And I think space technology allows us to do that. One of the important things that makes space technology very interesting is that nobody, if you have cables in the sea, people can damage them. 
or people having ill intention can actually get uh, cut those cables. We have seen that in the past, but with space technology, you're sure that your equipment is safe and you're able to provide a surveillance 24 by seven. So we, we support this uh, low label initiative from the University of Surrey, UNDP, the Ministry of ICT and the Honorable Minister who has been personally involved in setting up the space unit and taking it forward. So I wish all the participants fruitful workshop with the experts from Surrey. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suko. So I have now the pleasure of inviting Honorable Sudia Modu, Minister of Blue Economy, Marine Resources and Fisheries, to join us for his address. My colleague, Honorable Deepak Bhargobin, Minister of Information Technology, Communication and Innovation. Dr. Kavidad Suko, Chairperson of the Mauritius Research and Innovation Council. Professor Tishan Bauran, Executive Director of the MRIC. <clears throat> Dr. Rafaela Gida, Principal Investigator of the Surrey Space Center from the University of Surrey. Distinguished guests, obviously all protocol observed, especially I've heard that there are students and researchers and also uh, those attending online. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I was just asking uh, Dr. Rafael Gida, why Neuros? What is the meaning of Neuros? She told me that Neuros is a god, the protector of the ocean. I think many of you are even aware why Neuros were thinking that maybe abbreviation of some. So it's, it's a god, protector of the ocean. So good morning, all of you. It's a honor for me to be here today to attend the launching of this workshop entitled this is space-based maritime surveillance system for fisheries monitoring and anomaly detection. <clears throat> Obviously, our country is bestowed with an exclusive economic zone of great economic value and importance with a surface area of 2.3 million square kilometers, ranking among the 20 largest in the world. We are situated in an, in an ocean that is considered as most pristine compared to others and obviously able to generate seafood and sea products of highest quality. The fisheries sector contributes significantly to the economic development of Mauritius. Fisheries related activities such as import and export of fish and fish products, processing, transshipment, warehousing, and handling repairs and dry docking of fishing vessels contribute to the activities of the seafood hub sector. I'm pleased to see that the stakeholders in the sector are gathered today here, I recognize most of you, uh, to engage in purposeful discussions and together chart a new way forward in combating illegal, unreported, and unregulated IUU fishing. Ladies and gentlemen, IUU accounts for 10 to 30% of the global fish catch with around 20, 10 to 23 billion USD lost annually due to this illicit activity. Its consequences include encouraging overfishing, putting responsible fishers at a disadvantage, weakening coastal communities, threatening food security, and obviously promoting tax evasion and loss of income for many uh, states. Such fishing practices often have a deadly impact on the marine environment by damaging protected areas and catching juveniles and untargeted species, which are then discarded at sea, thereby leading to unnecessary stock depletion and deteriorated ecosystems. Illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing undermines efforts to conserve and manage fish stocks in capture fisheries and leads to both short-term and long-term economic and social loss. This has negative impacts on food security and environmental protection. Besides, 
economic, social, and environmental negative aspects, IUU fishers gain undue advantage over legitimate fishing. The IUU fishers act as free riders who benefit unfairly from the sacrifice made by others who implement all management and conservation measures. To avoid detection, obviously these IUU fishing vessels often operate at night without navigation lights, thereby putting the lives of its crew and fishermen at risk, especially in harsh and dangerous weather conditions. The unreported nature of IUU fishing makes it particularly difficult to quantify. Available information strongly suggests that despite apparent improvement in some uh, RFMO regional, regional situation, the amount of IUU fishing worldwide is increasing. But one thing I would like to draw the attention of all the stakeholders here, that if we right at this point in time, let's take Mauritian as an example. We do have, the, as was rightly pointed out by Dr. Bowden, that we have a VMS system actually uh, under my ministry. But this VMS caters only for those vessels who are licensed, was licensed under the Mauritian uh, government. Means we can see only those vessels who have their VMS on, that's all. But whatever the dark vessels, real time, this is unavailable on the VMS system. So I think this project cater for the AIS and the VMS, this is what I heard, and this is what is needed for uh, the surveillance and the real time surveillance for our EZ. So while some estimates suggest that the IU fishing may account for as much as one quarter of the total catch in the world's ocean, fully reliable data on IU fishing are by definition scarce. IU fishing is a global and multifaceted problem, and we are hopeful that through international, regional, and national efforts of all parties involved and affected by this phenomenon, we can efficiently and effectively tackle this issue. In fact, Mauritius has a vast, our vast is it, and the surveillance of this area is indeed a challenge. Besides from the demersal resources, which are still uh, underexploited. In fact, our MSY, as some of the stakeholders know this very well, we've got 6,000 tons yearly, and we're exploiting uh, only 1,200 tons. So I take this opportunity to make a call over to those who are interested. Right now, we have launched an expression of interest for the exploitation of the 4,800 uh, stock that resources that we have in our EZ. So besides from these demersal resources, which are found around the islands and on the oceanic banks, the resources of concern in most of the EZ are the pelagic species, that is the tuna and tuna likes. The highly migratory nature of tuna resources and variable distribution in both space and time renders surveillance even more difficult. Hence, much effort needs to be exerted with respect to the monitoring, control, and surveillance of tuna resources to combat IUU fishing. Satellite data has proven to be beneficial in managing vast area. I'm happy to see that the MRIC has taken the steps to tap into the potential of satellite in addressing national issues. So many national issues uh, through MRIC and uh, minister, under the, uh, the ministry of my colleague, it's uh, on all front, as rightly pointed out by Mr. Sukon, so many projects on the pipeline and so many have already started. Right? Indeed, this project come indeed at an important time where the government wants to develop further the blue economy sector with the aim of making it a strong pillar of our country in the real sense of the word. So ladies and gentlemen, my minister welcomes obviously the ongoing collaborative project between the Surrey Space Center and the MRIC involving satellite tracking and surveillance of our EZ, as yet another new avenue which will contribute to the national efforts to combat IU fishing. The right balance must be struck between actual physical fisheries, surveillance at sea, and other means of monitoring and control of the fisheries through measures as such as tracking using satellite data, VMS, and AIS monitoring. I hope that the IU detection tool, which will be developed from this project, will provide enhanced resources that would be needed by the Fisheries Division of my ministry and the National Coast Guard 
to prevent, detect, and eliminate IUU fishing effectively. In fact, since three months now, uh, during an IUTC meeting, I've known Snake, and it was in Thailand, uh, we got an opportunity. Uh, my officers were there. They take cognizance of uh, one platform, which we call, I think I will invite uh, the nearest team to go through that platform. It's called the Starboard Maritime Intelligence. I think that's the latest platform that has been created. And we have got to a trial period. We're using it since three months. Indeed, it's uh, uh, we are really play, uh, pleased to know that this is a tool that it is needed. So I suggest that you build upon this platform. Uh, in fact, through this platform, we're we'll able to uh, detect so many dog vessels in our EZ. In fact, that was more interesting. Suppose in this platform, it caters, suppose we find uh, an IU vessel in our uh, EZ. So we can't determine what the name of that vessel, where does it come from? But this is about it. I was really surprised to see that two years back, it can say where it comes from, means which port it has, and then we can detect obviously the name of that vessel and who are these dog vessels. So this is something very interesting. So I would recommend that the uh, Neuris team get appraised of this software while working on this uh, project. So I thank the MRIC again, the UNDP and their collaborators from the Surrey Space Center for taking this initiative to create this very important tool to protect our EZ. And obviously I wish all of you here all of you, especially our Mauritian, to take to come and do to come in a workshop. It's good that you participate and say whatever has to be said, whatever shortcomings, be it our EZ, be it in Lagoon, be it whatever is called, uh, which renders uh, uh, our ocean, uh, which is like a threat to our ocean. It's a platform where we can say, and then obviously uh, the team will be here to take cognizance, obviously one of the most, just recently, maybe as we are all victims of it, we have been victims of the Waka show recently. Right now, when we're talking, we have one fishing vessel on our most beautiful island at the Sebondo. We had got three, four vessels in the port area. So I would request uh, the news team, if they can take uh, in this project into account that if such vessel, uh, or nearing our coast, uh, if there is some sort of, uh, could trigger some sort of alert, not only a red light, because I was talking to uh, one of your officers in the project from Surrey, he would tell me, sometimes it happens, it triggers a red light, but it happens, it's human nature, maybe at two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, he's asleep, so he can't even see, you know, but it's a sort of alarm, which wakes, wakes up everybody and trigger, you know, at, at least we have enough time to attend those uh, vessels nearing our coastal, uh, our shoreline. So this is uh, one thing that will also uh, be of great help to us uh, with regard to, especially we've got so many little islands in the Indian Ocean. So obviously every time uh, we are victims, it happens that we have the safe, uh, safe passage, which is only 12 nautical miles. So we must have enough time to trigger an alert system so that uh, we can attend to this, uh, you know, this threat, it's, it's there. We've got uh, more than 40,000 cargo vessel going to the Southeast uh, coast of 12, 12 nautical miles. So I think we have to uh, encompass, uh, not only the EZ, but in a way that this project attend to all the threats with regard to the security of our island. And with these words, I again, once again, I wish you all a fruitful deliberation. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. I'll now invite Honorable Deepak Bhargobin, Minister of Information Technology, Communication and Innovation, to deliver the keynote address. Thank you, my colleague, the Honorable Sudhya Madhu, Minister of Blue Economy, Marine Resources, Fisheries, and Shipping, to also my colleague in the constituency, where we are from. 
Dr. Sukor, the chairperson of MRIC, the executive director, MRIC, Dr. Guida, principal investigator, Surrey Space Center, University of Surrey, heads of institutions, students, researchers, also those who are attending this conference online. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is a honor for me to be here today to officially launch this workshop entitled A Space-Based Marine Surveillance System for Fisheries Monitoring and Anomaly Detection. At the very outset, I am pleased to know that this project propels Mauritius at the forefront of research and development in the space field. We are benefiting from the support of the Surrey Space Center at the University of Surrey in the UK, one of the most renowned institutions worldwide in the UK for its R&D in the space field. I also acknowledge the support of UNDP, Ocean Initiative, Ocean Innovation Challenge, which gives the project a perspective of for worldwide applicability. We are indeed proud, ladies and gentlemen, that our small island, Mauritius, is now called, for two years now, we've integrated the small circle, what we call the space fearing nation. You will recall that in June 2021, Mauritius launched the first ever Mauritius nanosatellite, the MIASAT-1, with the support of United Nations Office and JAXA through a program called KiboCube. The satellite orbited the Earth for some 10 months and took some very meaningful pictures of Mauritius and the region. And I invite you to visit the website of MRIC to see the achievements of our satellite. And as all satellites in the world, there is a lifespan. And at one point in time, of course, it disintegrates, uh, comes to Earth, and it disintegrates, as I said. The Republic of Mauritius offers very interesting avenues to contribute to the knowledge in space already. We are in a geostrategic position on the globe, and it places us in this blind spot of the Indian Ocean for space observation. As a small island developing state, we are surrounded, my colleague just mentioned it, 2.3 million square kilometers of EEZ, which locks a huge potential for socioeconomic progress of this country. Hence, if you adopt the correct strategies, we are hopeful that soon we would be able to manage and exploit sustainably our oceanic resources and engage into high-end R&D to foster innovation in the country. And with this backdrop, and as a follow-up of our first nanosatellite, and you would imagine that Mauritius, as I said, a very small country. We, as a small country, we are supporting the ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization of India, one of the biggest space centers in the world. We are supporting them to be able to Track one of their satellites that were launched in November 2022 from our ground station in Eben so that they could get data whenever their satellite is coming into this region so that they could capture data for, of course, any usage that they feel. So you can see that the space technology is not like, you know, I think Dr. Sukha mentioned it. We're starting our adventure in the space today 
and tomorrow will land up on Mars. Not like this. Some people believe it is like this. We get some criticism, and you know it is of public domain. In Parliament, you can see it. In the press, you can see it that the government of Mauritius has spent money in the space sector. As if we press a button today, as I mentioned, and we land up on Mars tomorrow. It is not like this. It is lots of research, lots of innovation into it, lots of learning, and we are proud that we have our engineers, our local Mauritian young engineers that are working at the MRIC, that have been trained by the MRIC, that have benefited from lots of uh, international exposure, be it in class space in Glasgow, be it in in India. Very soon, we are embarking with the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center in Dubai. So we are slowly and slowly encouraging our youth to embrace this sector and we are building on capacity in the space sector. The space technology, as I said, is one of the best platform to boost innovation in a country. We also realize that capacity building in such and emerging sectors is of primordial importance. We can only achieve by exposing our younger generation to the latest technologies such as robotics, AI, and so on. And Mauritius is not the only country. African countries are slowly and slowly starting to engage into space technologies. If you take our neighbors, for example, South Africa, Kenya, Egypt, they have already launched their first nanosatellite and collecting data from space. The mandate of MRIC was extended to conduct priority and high-level research that, so that we could strengthen and our research ecosystem in Mauritius. The government firmly believes that the space technology represents a very important potential socioeconomic pillar of the country. It will take some time. We are a small country. We need resources. We need help. But in the decades to come, it will become a very important pillar of the economy. And my ministry strongly encourages such bold initiatives, which in my opinion brings lots of hope in the decades to come towards development of this sector. With this collaboration between MRIC and the Surrey Space Center, we aspire to get a glimpse of how space source data, space technology, and developed with AI, emerging technologies, machine learning, could be transformed in a very strong tool to consolidate our maritime surveillance system already in place. And as my very good friend, the Minister Modu mentioned, that it is important for the country to get all those tools, to get all those equipments, to get all those data, to be able to more control our maritime surveillance, to more control our fishing zone, so that we don't have all these illegal fishing or illegal boats coming in our EEZ. You have other types of vessels coming in and you see what's happening these days. Some of them are not seaworthy and then on the way to Mauritius or across Mauritius, they are broken down and it becomes the problem of government. So all these would help, in fact, the ministry, the government, to better manage this area. So ladies and gentlemen, let me, let me end up here. Um, the first Mauritian satellite gave a, gave a good opportunity to Mauritius as the first chapter to be able to 
you know, look at the outer space as a new tool for research and development and innovation for our country. Our collaboration today with the University of Surrey opens another chapter for Mauritius to engage very in depth in research and development in space and exploiting data for advising and policy. Very soon, by end of this month, we are engaging with another institution so that our young people could get capacity building. We at MRIC, the space unit, could get help for um, payload facilities in other satellites. In months to come, we are signing with big institutions like ISRO so that there is capacity building, there's training for our people, and it will continue to go and we will continue to develop our space unit. We'll continue to invest money, albeit criticism, albeit all types of, you know, uh, demagogy. But this is no more. We are used to it by now, isn't it, my good friend? We will continue to invest in the space for our younger generation, because as a government, we don't see tomorrow, we see for the next 10, 15, 20 years, our youngsters, our young students, and maybe some of you don't know, maybe I don't know if, if our friends from university know that we have trained students at the secondary schools here in Mauritius. I don't know how many of them, 18 schools, 18 schools. We have trained students from 18 secondary schools. And you won't believe those students in Form 5, Form 6, they have built up their own antenna in schools, small antennas. We have trained them. They build up small antennas, which are placed on top of the school, and they are already trying to capture data and get some pictures of all satellites that goes around this area. And you could see those students so much interested in this new technology. So we are preparing for the future. We are preparing for the next 20 years. And we will continue to put lots of efforts in space technology. And as I said, this could result in helping the country as we are trying to do with the maritime sector today, the surveillance sector today, and this could help in many other avenues. Let me end up here by thanking the MRC, the University of Surrey team, my good friend, the minister, to be present here this morning. And I wish to thank also the UNDP for this uh, initiative, for supporting this. And let me wish you all the best and officially now declare the workshop as open. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister. So before we end this uh, particular ceremony, we are going to have a signing, a official signing ceremony of the contract agreement. Let me please invite uh, Dr. Rafael Guida uh, to uh, give you a, a brief overview, and then we'll invite Professor and uh, for the signature. Yeah. Thank you, Rico. Yeah. Yeah, as you say, yeah. Oh, 
Ladies and gentlemen, now that the protocol of uh, function is over, I'll request uh, Mr. Guido to give us a plan on what is news. Thank you. Good morning, bonjour, everyone. My name is Rafaela Guida and I come from the Surrey Space Center at the University of Surrey. It's a big pleasure to be here today. And first of all, I would like to thank all my colleagues from the University of Surrey and from the Mauritius Research and Innovation Council for making this day possible. Thank you. So thanks, Dr. Venture from the Surrey Space Center. And I would like to thank the whole Mauritius really because from the first day here, I've really received a very warm welcome. Thank to you all being an Italian coming from the South. This is incredibly important to me. This is going to be a memorable day. A day in which the characteristics and technical specification of a space-based tool to monitor illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing are going to be defined, but not by the space mission designer. We are not using a top-down approach. The techniques, the characteristics, the specs are going to be defined by the authorities, the experts, the scientists, and the overall community this tool will benefit. I'm going to give you a couple of ideas about what we are going to offer with the nearest project. I was asked before what nearest stand for. So for everyone, nearest was the ancient Greek god protecting the oceans, even more ancient than Poseidon, which some of us may know. And that's the reason why we wanted to call the project against him. So we are getting today, as I said, to raise awareness about NEROS and to collect the feedback, which we will do in the later brainstorming sessions. And the feedback we would like to collect is really about what should the tool do for this community, for Mauritius. So is a partnership. You have seen and you have witnessed a signatory ceremony between the UK partner, Surrey Space Center, and the Mauritius Research and Innovation Council. But the project does receive a lot of support everywhere in the world in many forms. We do have already data from the Japanese Space Agency, from the US, from Caspella Space, and in particular, the UK Space Agency is really providing daily acquisitions over Mauritius. At the time we are speaking, a radar data is being acquired over the exclusive economic zone in Mauritius, and this is happening daily. And we are now building what we believe 
is the largest radar data set ever built for Mauritius. But we need to exploit it. We can't just acquire data and forget about it. What I always teach to my students, you will never prove the success of a mission until you use the data for the benefit of the humanity and for many applications. And that's really what the NEARS is about with a very specific topic and theme, which is illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. This is what NEARS could provide you with, is a map that has been produced by looking at two kinds of data sets, radar data coming from synthetic aperture radar missions and AIS, automatic identification systems, which normally are on board many vessels, including fishing vessels. AIS, however, is a kind of system that can be manipulated, can be turned off, or can still transmit, but wrong information on a purpose. So what we would like to do is to compare the AIS information with what we get from the radar data. Because instead, the radar can never lie. Radar is a kind of system that can acquire an image in every weather condition, which is important in presence of clouds coverage, and in every light condition. If fishing is happening at night, radar will be able to acquire an image. By looking and comparing these two kinds of data sets and looking with machine learning approaches at any mismatching in time, we will be able to trigger alert and understand where there is a need to check the situation in some particular areas. We need to do it in time. One single opportunity will not be sufficient because you can still have a fault of an AIS system. But if it is happening frequently, you then start doubting it's just a fault. And this is what this map is about, where you see dark red regions is where this mismatching is happening very frequently and is then worth to have a look. So now imagine transferring this map from the English channel where we started working at to the Mauritius exclusive economic zone and imagine these red areas alerting about potential illegal fishing activities happening. We speak generally about anomalies because we can't say really illegal fishing, but it's still an information very important to, to provide. So what is NEARS going to offer, as I said? Uh, we want to transfer this technology here, but we also want to announce it. So we started in Surrey with comparison of SAR data, radar data, and AIS, but we want to improve it. Okay, We just want to sit on what we previously built, and this will be done with the newest, most advanced uh, space data from upcoming constellation. One of these is, for example, the high resolution thermal data from the satellite view mission, as well as new radar data coming from new missions. There are four outcomes for the projects, and they can be summarized with four simple words, evaluate, support, restore, and recover. In order to solve the problem, we need to understand first the extent of the problem. So we need to really make ourselves aware of how much illegal fishing is spread in the exclusive economic zone, what the impact is environmentally and economically. Once we have this knowledge and we will get it with the space data, we will move to the second stage, which is about supporting the local authorities. That's exactly what we wish to do. Trigger alerts that authorities can use. 
really to stop and combat illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. Uh, however, as I said, we are really, really concerned about the economic and environmental impact of illegal reported and regulated fishing. So what the aspiration here is, the ambition here is of NERIS is really looking into how devastating these effects were in the past and what sort of inversion or trend we need to propose in order to speak again about the sustainability. So how can we use space data to understand how to recover in fish stock? And particularly, we will do for tuna species that are now overfished. The last one will be understanding and support the economic recovery. So we do have some ideas from the literature about the economic impact of IU activities here, but also in other parts of the world. But very often, this kind of information, like the same information on catch, are based on fishery-dependent data, while well, instead we need to do as much as we can with fishery-independent data and space data are an example of this. So the project will have a lot of outputs within these four outcomes. The tool will be one, and we need to have conversations with the authorities and the community about where the tool needs to be run, who is going to run it, and what sort of skills are required. For the skills, we have an idea and we will provide a building capacity program. And also there, we need to understand who needs to be really equipped with the right skills for that. And finally, this fantastic workshop and the other initiatives like this, where we can meet with the community, receive feedback, and make sure that the end user requirements are really considered in the design of the final tool. Reports and publications will be made available to everyone, of course, so that you can be made aware of how we are progressing with the nearest. And with this, I'm going to conclude my talk and really thank you again for, for listening and for supporting. We will now, I think, go to the break. Thank you. Thank you, Rafaela. Pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen. We have now come to the end of this particular ceremony, so we wish to thank all the interveners and now we wish to invite you for a cup of tea and please let's be back at 10.55 at latest. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, um, I hope uh, you've had a chance uh, to have some coffee and uh, have some networking with uh, the many stakeholders present today. So we'll resume the program after the uh, protocol ceremony. Um, so we will have uh, the online address of uh, Professor Bob uh, Nicole, Pro Vice Chancellor and Executive Dean of uh, the FEPS of the University of Surrey. So he'll address us his uh, thoughts. So um, I'll invite my colleagues to pause on the, the video, please. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bob Nicol. I'm the Executive Dean and Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences here at Surrey. Let me start by congratulating my colleagues in the Surrey Space Center for undertaking this globally recognized impactful research. The project you are about to discuss, I'm passionate about for many reasons. First and foremost, it uses our heritage in satellite construction and design. Second of all, we have just launched our Institute of Sustainability, demonstrating our passion for living on the planet we have been given. As an astronomer, I'm acutely aware that there aren't many other planets like the planet Earth, so we must look after it. Finally, I live near the coast here in the UK, and I have witnessed firsthand at how illegal fishing can really damage the ecosystems of our coast. So putting all that together, I really see this as one of the fundamental projects that we need to push forward, both as a faculty and as a university. I wish you luck today. I encourage you to have bold conversations, and I hope this is a long-lasting relationship. Thank you, and I'm sorry I couldn't be with you. Good day. Thank you. So um, we have uh, now um, the, um, sorry, Dr. Mary Matthews, which is the Ocean Advisor and Ocean Innovation Challenge Manager, who is online. Uh, I, can we have uh, the video uh, online, please? Yes, hello, Mary. Hi, thank Hi. you. Yeah, so thank you. So apologies for this uh, delays, but uh, the audience and the floor is yours now for your address, please. Thank you so much. And I'm very happy to be here on behalf of the United Nations Development Program. Uh, UNDP is happy to collaborate with you all on this effort. UNDP's Ocean Innovation Challenge congratulates you all on this very exciting initiative, which so very well fits our very rigorous selection criteria. The Ocean Innovation Challenge innovations must be truly innovative transformative, replicable, scalable, poverty reducing, livelihood creating and gender mainstreaming. Our donors, CETA and NORAD are both dedicated to supporting sustainable fisheries and we're eager to see the positive results of this important effort. We appreciate very much the importance of combating IUU fishing and using state-of-the-art technologies and detecting and analyzing data on IUU fishing, the importance of the cooperation between the government of Mauritius, the Surrey Space Center, and the Mauritius Research and Innovation Council in the implementation of this effort. We're eager to see great success through the transfer of knowledge to the national stakeholders in Mauritius in the use of the monitoring and detection systems for IUU fishing 
evidenced by this meeting and the ongoing efforts. And we are very much looking forward to the upscaling and replication of your successful experience here of this project to other SIDS and LDCs challenged by the scourge of IUU fishing. Thank you, and we wish you all the very best and great success for this important work. Thank you very much, Mary, uh, for finding some time despite your busy schedule. So we hope to see you for other meetings online. So a big hand of applause for, for Mary. Thank you very much. So um, uh, we'll now uh, move on to the rest of uh, the presentation. We will call upon um, our next speaker, Ms. Gauria, Technical Officer of the Ministry of uh, Blue Economy, Marine Resources, Fisheries and Shipping. She will talk about the cell monitoring system in the EEZ of Mauritius. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me first of all say that it's an honor and a pleasure to be here today. And thank you. May I use this too? Thank you. Uh, our, my main objective here is to explain to you how the VMS works. I am posted in, at the Ministry of Fisheries, and we have a fisheries monitoring center that is located at Albion. And over there, we have a team who is dedicated to monitor and survey the whole uh, ocean uh, of the whole region of Mauritius. I will start by introducing some of the frequent terminology that I will be using. FMC is Fisheries Monitoring Center. As I mentioned, it's in Albion. And we have a team there that works 24 by seven, meaning that we are posted on office hours and we also work on public holidays and uh, weekends to ensure that we are able to survey the, the activities of fishing vessels within our region. The vessel monitoring system is only a software that encourages data transfer from fishing vessels to our system, and it's all stored on our servers. We have the vessel monitoring system since 2005, and we have data dating from 2005 for analysis by our technical officers. Lastly, MCS, as most of you are aware, is monitoring control and surveillance that encompasses all our duties in the ministry. Please. Management tools. I'll, I'll be straight for, to the point because uh, we it is necessary, it is important for us to really understand that NIRIUS is going to be groundbreaking for us because as long as we know, we have uh, been very in, um, dependent on other nations to be able to gather information. And with NIRIUS, which is made with the support of other people, but with local data, it's going to be groundbreaking, as I mentioned, because we'll be given opportunity to really survey our region. And it is important because Mauritius is situated in the Indian Ocean at a very strategic point where there's a lot of maritime traffic and we have so much going on in our waters. Even with the system that we have today, as, I, as the minister rightly uh, mentioned earlier, that we survey only the ves vessels that are registered and we apply the VMS only as a method to monitor the vessels that are in the legal side of operations that are, they are still reporting, they are still making us aware of their activities and they are still giving us their data. What we aim to do is with the support of our legislation is to keep, be able to gather information of with uh, all the dog vessels that are here. As I mentioned, the VMS is operational since 2005, and we have a strong regulation on the VMS that allows all fishing vessels that want to operate in our region to have a fishing license. As per the fishing license, it is mandatory for them to have a VMS uh, transponder 
on the vessels already installed. What they do is they give us the IDs of the, um, the, the transponder on board and we register this to on our system. As per the registration, we are able to monitor this vessel anywhere in our waters within the EZ and also beyond the EZ in case the VMS is, is still on. The VMS uh, regulations that are, was introduced in 2005 had, was a baseline for us. And in 2002, it was improved because we, met, we, uh, we weren't aware that there were some loopholes that we had to address. And we had to make the fine a little bit more uh, stronger to be able to deter any IUU fishing. And for now, as per 2022, the fine is actually in quantified in euros now, and it's up to 1 million euros, or it's like on it in the motion rupees. Um, the function of my office is really to survey all fishing activities. What we do is we set up in our office a schedule of how to monitor fishing vessels. We have a daily routine of checking all the fishing vessels that are in the waters. We check the entry exit of all fishing vessels that uh, give us their entry into port or entry into EZ. And what we do is we make a database of all the activities in the EZ. What is also important that we aim to control these this traffic for better protection and better management of our resources because our resources is depleting over the years and we need better control for this to be able to sustain until further years. Um, please. The VMS straightforward is a system, a system that uses satellite networks to be able to function. What happens is that depending on the process on which the fishing vessel has installed the, the equipment, we are able to, in real time, that in real time means that it's less than 30 minutes for the, the data from the fishing vessels to reach my workstation. In simple terms, we get access to the location, speed, and direction of any fishing vessels that are registered with the Mauritius, with the government of Mauritius, in our waters when they are fishing, and we can decipher this data with training, with proper training that we have on the job, to be able to survey the vessels and their activities within our region. The VMS is also used by the NCG in the National Coast Guard, and all data that we receive, they are able to see, as well as other systems that they have on their, on their, on their end. Any vessel that are registered with the fisheries authorities are seen by the NCG. Next, please. Here is a little uh, diagram. If you're able to, 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 for you to be able to better see what we do. As I mentioned, this, the point is quite small, but depending on the, fishing vessels, the type of fishing vessels that are at sea, the data will bounce up to the types of satellites that are in space. And all this data is going to bounce onto our uh, FMC. So all these steps are necessary for us to be able to get data. And so far, it's been foolproof for the VMS, because the VMS, as I mentioned, is as per the operator's uh, diligence, because they have to be in, uh, in, installed on the vessel in the case that we want to fish here. If they are they're not able to give us information on the VMS on the vessel, they are not allowed in our waters. They are not allowed to fish in our waters. They are not allowed to use the resources that are that is available in Mauritius. For an uh, overview, this is what I see uh, every day uh, coming into the office. What you see here is the delimitation of the EZ. 
and previous piece, previous. The delimitation of the EZ that's given by the blue line over here. This is Mauritius, this is Rotrix, and this is for scale saint where the where you know there's a fishing vessel aground right now. All the colored dots that you see represents a fishing vessel, either foreign or national. But this, this is how we see the data on the VMS. As I mentioned, it is on our onus that we are able to defer what kind of vessels is being seen and what, kind, what are the uh, activities that, is, that are being carried out. Point to be made here, the VMS controls only fishing vessels and not cargo or any types of other vessels. So it is strongly uh, for fishing monitoring and not on anything else. The VMS also allows us to uh, give it an idea of what kind of fishing the boat is, uh, is doing. Uh, the various types of fishery that are carried out in Mauritius include the purse sailing, include also long lining and uh, semi-industrial fisheries that are carried out on banks around uh, on the northeast of Mauritius. Over there, we have a number of local vessels that go towards daily fishing. And with the VMS, we are able to see how they uh, carry out their fishing. We are able to track their movement and we're also able to track their the preferred fishing grounds as to how they are, they are able to operate and where they are able to, see, to go each and every season. And this data is being collected at the FMC. We also try to monitor any anomalies, as for example, the broken lines that you that is visible here, as indicated by the arrows, is a lapse of time that we had no reporting on the VMS. That there may be a gap of two hours, four hours, or any time of period that the vessel wasn't monitoring, wasn't giving data to us. And this is on our end that we have to really investigate what happened to the vessel during that time where there was, there was no uh, reporting on the VMS, but we know that the vessel is still uh, operating at sea. And we have to really strongly go towards investigation of what's happening at sea over beyond 400, 200 to 500 nautical miles from where we are standing today here. Next, we have new tools that we are desperate for because we have only the vessel monitoring system for now. We have traditional uh, MCS tools, such as placing uh, observers on board fishing vessels, or we have the logbooks that uh, are given to us by the fishing operators. But what we do now need is innovation in terms of how to detect the vessels and what are they doing in, uh, at sea especially at night where there are no patrols, no officials to really figure out what they're doing. New tools with a combination of methods to really give us an idea of what the, vessel, what the fishing vessels are up to and what kind of um, trade they are carrying out at sea, what kind of transshipments they're going uh, doing out at sea. And also what kind of... Uh, uh, the, the markets, what, an, what kind of uh, harbors they are going to, because it's important for us to retain traceability of, a, of the fish that comes from our EZ onto a, a foreign markets. All this towards really sustainable development and sustainable fisheries. Well, thank you for your time. That's all I have for today. Uh, Ms. Gabriel. Now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Cossi.
managing uh, stock is resolution 2101 on an interim plan for the rebuilding of yellowfin tuna stocks. This uh, resolution has been uh, put in place so as to maintain the stocks in perpetuity. And Mauritius has been allocated a quota of 10.5 tons for the year 2022. That is, Mauritius sh should not uh, go beyond this catch during this year. And we also have a resolution for skipjack tuna. And uh, the main objective of this resolution is to maintain the skipjack tuna stock in perpetuity and to maintain the catch within the catch limit that has been set for the period of 2021-2023. The cash limit has been set around 500,000 tons. And furthermore, in addition to the measures in the FMOA, we have some schemes that help in restoring and managing our ecosystem and fish stocks. We have the buyback scheme, which is a scheme uh, uh, which has been put in place with a view to minimizing damage caused by the lagoon by fishing net. And in this scheme, the net license holders of fishing nets are encouraged to voluntarily surrender their nets and net license. In 1996, there were 33 large nets which was active. Against in 2022, there were 15 large nets. And we have a canot scheme. Therefore, the ministry has, is providing financial assistance for, to fishermen and cooperative societies to purchase better boats, which are known as canots, to fish outside the lagoon area, so as to reduce fishing pressure in the lagoon. And the grant represents around 50% of the cost of a canot and engine, and can go up to a maximum amount of 200,000 rupees. And the Third scheme is the semi-industrial vessel scheme. This is also to reduce pressure in the lagoon. The fishermen cooperative societies are encouraged to purchase industrial, semi-industrial fishing vessels to go and fish on the fishing banks. And the grant represents around 50% of the cost of a semi-industrial fishing vessels, up to a maximum of 4, 4 million rupees. So to conclude, uh, monitoring, control, and surveillance of fishing vessels are therefore important so as to maintain our fishing stock. And surveillance tools are among the main features in monitoring our fishing. And I believe the NEROS application will help with our monitoring of fishing activities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kossi. Very interesting uh, overview of uh, what we have, uh, uh, the measures in place. Um, so uh, I'd just like to remind our online viewers that uh, they can ask uh, their questions via our Slido application. So you will need to log on to our uh, website, spacemauritius.com, where you will get all the details. So let us uh, pursue with uh, the overview of what uh, the different um, aspects of uh, uh, the, the uh, ocean economy we have. Today, let's uh, I have the pleasure of welcoming Ms. Rina Satyawati, uh, Director of Blue Economy and Fisheries Management of the Indian Ocean Rim Association. Dr. Satyawati. Thank you, Dr. Vikram. Good morning, uh, Excellencies, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me begin by expressing my appreciation to Mauritius Research and Innovation Council for organizing this exciting workshop. I'm Rina Stiawati, the Director for Blue Economy and Fisheries Management of Indian Ocean Rim Association. It is an honor for me to have the opportunity to deliver a presentation on the role of IORA in combating IU fishing in this workshop today. 
First, I'll briefly explain about IORA and its work on blue economy, and then I will elaborate uh, the status of IUU fishing in Indian Oceans and the importance of this issue uh, in IORA. After that, I will share the progress by uh, in the, uh, uh, the the progress of IORA works in combating IUU fishing, uh, including our partnership with international organization and other partners. And then I'll close my presentation by sharing the way forward on the future works of IORA uh, in assisting member states to combat IU fishing. But before I continue my presentations, I'm wondering if all of you know about IORA. So we will do a quick quiz. Um, if you could answer the question, I'll have a little gift for you. Okay, let's do, sorry. Yes, quiz time. The first question, does anyone know where the office of IORA is? Raise your hand. Okay, yes, back. Okay, correct, next time I come. So there will be a little gift for you after this. All right, the second questions. Okay, uh, please do not Google it. How many members state of IORA? Okay. All right. You can Google it. <laughs> Raise your hand if you can find the answer. Okay. Going once. <laughs> going two. Okay. The lady of 23. Correct. Okay. So little gift for you as well. The last questions. Okay. Out of this 23 member state, please mention five of the IRA member state very quickly. Okay. Yes. The lady again on the back with this uh, black shirt. <laughs> you did that. All right. Just mention it very quickly. Five member states of IRA. No. Some of them is dialogue partner, not the members. So anyone else would like to try? E Okay, yes. Okay, um, no. Uh, still incorrect. Okay, anyone else? Still want to try? Uh, okay, where was the next? Okay. Is it correct? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, a little gift for you after the sessions. Okay, so I would like to all of you to give your warm applause to yourself because you know I I a little bit now. Okay, now let me briefly explain about Indian Ocean Rim Association. Uh, this is a unique association uh, aiming at sustainable development and balanced growth in the Indian Ocean by focusing on regional cooperation through project-based approach. So that's the keyword, the project-based approach. We have 23 member states and 10 dialogue partners. And um, IORA have uh, six priority areas, namely maritime safety and security, trade and investment facilitations, fisheries management, disaster risk management, academic science and technology cooperation, and also tourism promotion and cultural exchange. To strengthen the work of IORA, we adopted two cross-cutting issues, namely blue economy and women economic empowerment. The blue economy, is one of the cross-cutting issue in IORA uh, and one of uh, the issue that really important nowadays. And since the introduction of this issue in IORA um, in 2014, member states uh, are committed to make these sectors as a driver for a balanced social economic growth and sustainable development. Here you can see in the slide, we have identified six priority areas in blue economy cooperation, namely fisheries and aquaculture, seaport and shipping, uh, offshore hydrocarbon and seabed minerals, marine biotechnology research and development, tourism, and renewable ocean energy. We have made uh, substantial progress in developing this sector in IORA. 
uh, we established two functional bodies that work on uh, uh, this uh, blue economy, namely the working group on blue economy and also core group on fisheries management. And these two functional bodies uh, have been make uh, have been playing a a big role in addressing the issue of IU fishing, which I will elaborate uh, later. Okay, now let us move to the, the status of IU fishing uh, in Indian Ocean uh, Ocean um, region. Ladies and gentlemen, Indian Oceans is the third largest oceans in the world that play an important role uh, in shipping and also fisheries industry. However, Iora as a group overall is more exposed to IUU fishing risks and is uh, performing less well uh, in combating IUU fishing um, compared to the global average. And according to the information of uh, Fusion of Center Indian Ocean uh, regions, uh, there were 379 and, and 213 incidents uh, of IU fishing in Indian Ocean regions in 2020 and the first half of 2021, respectively. And IU fishing activities post the security of international waters to don't write the critical level of illegal activities uh, such as human trafficking, drag, uh, drug, and also arms uh, smuggling. The importance of IUU, the importance of IUU fishing uh, has been long recognized by the member state of Iora. We have adopted some important documents uh, at the ministerial and also the leaders levels, uh, which contain the element or mandated the member state to combat uh, IUU fishing. As you can see uh, on the slide, these are four key documents adopted by the ministers at the ministerial uh, conference on blue economy. So the, the third first document, um, Mauritius Declaration, Jakarta Declaration, and also DACA Declaration, it was adopted by the ministers, uh, which contain the element on combating IU fishing. And the last document, this is also the most important one, uh, adopted by leaders. Uh, this document um, encourage member states to enhance regional and international uh, cooperation on mechanism to combat IU fishing. You may Google and, and, and find uh, this three, uh, these four important documents later. Okay. Distance uh, participant, ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned before, we have two functional bodies that works on IU fishing. So the first one is working group on blue economy. This uh, working group, uh, chair by uh, South Africa. Uh, the vision of this uh, working group is to promote socially, economically inclusive and environmentally sustainable development of the blue economy. And the, this working group have adopted a working plan consists of project. It's a real project uh, identified by the member state for implementation of for a short, medium and long-term period. And one of the objective of this working group is to combat IU fishing in Iora. So here uh, you can see there are activities that have been integral, uh, integral part of the work plan, ranging from the assessment of capacity uh, needs of the member state up, up to uh, product, providing support for, for member state to have a uh, uh, to build capacity on remote sensing method for identifying IU vessels. And the next uh, functional bodies that also work on combating IU fishing in Iora is core group on fisheries management. Uh, this course, this uh, core group was established in 2020 and led by Indonesia. One of the objective of this core group is to promote uh, responsible fishing practice, including to deter and uh, prevent illegal, illegal uh, unreported and unregulated uh, fishing. And uh, within this core group, uh, there was also a work plan identified by the member state and consists of some uh, related activities uh, to combat IUU fishing. 
as you can see before i have explained the work plan a comprehensive work plan that we have within iora to combat iu fishing however we cannot do it alone as from iora we are we have been strengthening our cooperations with relevant stakeholder member states uh, international organizations academician all the stakeholders uh, to explore funding uh, possibilities to, to carry out the project that uh, stipulated in the our in our work plan here you can see uh, what we have been doing so far in combating iu fishing in the region within the framework uh, cooperation between iora and french development agency or ifd uh, several uh, so, sorry several related capacity programs and pro project covering wide range of uh, topic on iu fishing have been implemented we also have two reports uh, on analysis uh, measures to combat iu fishing in the iora region and also report on assessment of the capacity need and current level of implementation of port state measures in iora regions you may find most of this report in our website um we also now uh, currently working with food and agri agriculture organizations in the uh, in developing a work plan for implementation of our framework partnership uh, iora six the assistant from from fao to implement the work plan of core group of fisheries management in promoting the ratification and implementation of the pcma through information material among iora uh, member state a distinguished participant, ladies and gentlemen, um, Iora member state continue facing increasing risk of IU fishing. Therefore, we Iora is committed to strengthen our efforts in combating IU fishing in uh, Indian Ocean region. Uh, these are all that we are committed to be doing in Iora. And for the way forward, uh, we are currently working with AIFD. Uh, French Development Agency and also other member states to develop IORA guidelines to prevent entry of IU fisheries products within IORA member state uh, supply chains. And furthermore, we also furthermore we also uh, promote exchange um, of information by member state through existing electronic system and database such as EPSM. IU fishing remain a great challenge for us for iora for indian ocean uh, region therefore we will continue working together with all stakeholders including academics and also um, international organization to combat iu fishing and i'm pleased to learn today that uh, mric pays a great attention to these issues so and rest assured that iora stand ready to working together with mric and also other stakeholders in mauritius uh, in fight against IU fishing. That's all my presentation and happy to answer any question later. And don't forget to collect your, your gift after this. Thank you. Thank you, Rina. A very interactive presentation, I should say. Um, now I'll have the pleasure to invite Mr. Jean Lindsay Azi who is the project manager of Ecofish of UNDP Mauritius. He'll talk to us about gender analysis and gender and youth action plan within the fisheries sector in Mauritius and Rodrigues. Thank you, Dr. Bichonet. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. All protocol observed. It's my pleasure for you. For, it's a pleasure for me to be in front of you this morning. In fact, I'm Jean Inziazi, as said by Dr. Bissonnet, project manager with UNDP on a four year uh, implemented project. And it's connected to the fishery sector and more precisely within the uh, artisanal fishery. So I would like also to thank the MRIC together with. Uh, Dr. Rafaela from Surrey. In fact, we've been interacting before uh, online, and now it's a pleasure to be in front and to be face to face. So I'll bring you, I'll uh, go through 
a specific activity that we've got, what we've been doing with, uh, under this project, which is to ensure gender mainstreaming within the fishery sector. It's, in fact, it is a very important component on which uh, UNDP is paying much attention at large. We have had rec recommendation to ensure that more women and youth are being included or considered in all projects that we are implementing. I would like also here to highlight the support that have been provided by my colleagues through the Accelerator Lab team. We have uh, Avinash, we have uh, Ayushi, and we have Melanie here present. And we've been doing this together. So, sorry. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, okay. Sorry. No. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, in fact, um, as I've said earlier, UNDP is committed to making gender equality a, a basic human right and necessity for a sustainable uh, world a reality. And uh, you know, UNDP has strategic plans that have been developed, and the latest one, uh, dated 2022 to 2025. Special emphasis have been, pay, have been made on gender equality and empowerment of women, whereby it has been pointed out the need to integrate gender concern into the six signature solutions, and gender, uh, whereby gender equality is the role focused on signature solution number six. So we have six sign signature solution, and the sixth one is focused on gender mainstreaming. Also, uh, UNDP has recently developed a gender equality strategy, 2022 to 2025. And there again, um, gender has been um, uh, pointed out or to, to, to form part into the three directions of change, namely structural, trans structural transformation, leaving no one behind and building resilience. And of course, you can uh, Google and have further details about both strategies and their uh, different components. So uh, what we have been doing in this project is um, a specific gender analysis within the fishery sector. And what is in fact gender analysis? It is a systematic analytical process based on sex segregated and gender information. And the process is used to identify and understand and describe gender differences and relevance of gender roles and power dynamics. And specifically, as I've been saying since my uh, intervention, is through the fisheries sector. So the um, objectives of doing gender analysis within this, uh, I mean, under this specific project, is to have a better insight about gender dynamics uh, within the sector and also to enable us to have a better idea about gender uh, involvement or gender throughout the sector, we needed to do a baseline study. And uh, within that baseline study, the idea was to understand how men and women interact with coastal and marine resources, and also to enhance women uh, participation within the artisanal fishery sector. And it's very important to mention that the, uh, this um, uh, gender analysis has been carried out both in Mauritius and Rodrigues. So the end goal is to help to mainstream gender within the fisheries sector in the Republic of Mauritius. So uh, with the project management team, together with Accelerator Lab and other colleagues in the office, we went uh, in four coastal areas in Mauritius, namely in Mayburg, Trudeau-Douce, um, Grand Gaume, and in Tamarin. And very late in the afternoon, because the fisher used to go fishing during the day. So we've been sitting with them, and we had focus group discussions. And a set of questions was set. And those um, focus group discussions uh, uh, enabled us to have a better idea about uh, women ill movement. So a set of, of, of questions was set. And uh, just to mention that, for example, in Mauritius, we met with 131 participants, out of which 
uh, 87% were men and 13% were women. That's a very important statistic because it clearly demonstrated that men is more involved kind of within the fishery sector. But depending in which component we are looking, it may differ as I will demonstrate later on. So um, this is about a summary of the outcomes of this specific study that we carried out. And as I've been um, explaining before, the assessment uh, helped to demonstrate the roles of women and men in fishing communities. And uh, we have been able to demonstrate that it's kind of integrated. Men and women roles within the fishery, fishery sector is kind of integrated, but unequal. Also, um, this inequality uh, is um, has highly been demonstrated, especially within the de decision making process. In certain areas, for example, in terms of fund management, both men and women are highly involved. But in terms of, for example, of procurement of fishing gears, men are mostly the one involved to take the relevant decision because the equipment, in fact, the fishing gears are being owned by the men within the sector. So uh, also uh, through the um, focus group discussion, it was revealed that um, ten, in 10 or 20 years, our fishing was done by family men only. So in the past, uh, mostly men were undertaking uh, activities within the fishery sector, but now it's kind of, there is a kind of share of responsibilities. And um, as I said, women has kind of a more active role uh, within the sector. And uh, also uh, we've noticed that uh, through the four areas that we've been in Mauritius, in Mayburg, uh, we have more women who are directly involved within the fishery sector. But in other areas, uh, as I mentioned earlier, women are mostly involved uh, in the post-harvesting uh, activities. Post-harvesting is about selling of fish or doing value addition to the fish product. Uh, as I said earlier also, um, both men and, and women control the fishing earnings because of the different level of engagement within the sector. Um, this has already been shared. So in terms of a, a very important um, consideration within the sector, it has been demonstrated that women is highly involved within the household cause as compared to a man. And this is also very important. If we want to mainstream gender within the sector, that is to have more women being involved within the sector, we need to consider this aspect because it's kind of a set baseline as a date. Uh, at the fish landing sites, that's the place where the fishers landed their catch when after, after they've been uh, out at sea. So it has been demonstrated that both men and women are involved in the activities happening there, but the activities differ. So as I've said earlier, men are mostly involved within the manutation with handling of, of fishing gears, whereby women are mostly involved with post-harvesting uh, activities. It has unfortunately also been demonstrated that uh, more and more, the youngsters are less interested within the fishery sector. And the reason for this is because they are finding uh, job opportunities in other sector, which uh, require less effort than the, um, the fishery sector. And that's why that explains the reason of this specific project, whereby we are including technology for the benefit of the fishery community. So um, a very important um, output of this, uh, or finding out of this, of this research is that the both men and women highlighted about security, which is very important. And you, because since we are, we are pushing uh, and the, the authorities here, the policy idea is to encourage fisherwomen, fishermen and fisherwomen to go into the outer lagoon. The, those, uh, this community highlighted 
about the security aspect. So it's very important to consider security. And we also highlighted about the competitors in terms of uh, external uh, vessel, not necessarily uh, being recognized by the Republic of Mauritius, who, which are fishing around uh, specific uh, devices that have been led uh, at sea, what we call fish aggregating devices. And they um, are seeing this as, as a threat to their living because those vessels, they have uh, strong gears, they have better gears, they have better facilities. So they are the one to reach those fads very early in the morning. And unfortunately, this is decreasing their potential of catch. So we believe that this um, uh, collaboration that we are having with uh, both MRIC and Surrey looking into uh, IUU is a good opportunity for the benefit of the artisanal and coastal fisher community. As I said earlier, we've been to Rodrigues, and um, Rodrigues, in fact, the results are quite different, given that women intervention or women action within the fishery sector is more pronounced. For example, within the octopus fishery sector, you have uh, many women who are involved, and those women were used to fish within the lagoon itself. In fact, the men are the ones who go uh, more towards the outer lagoon. And this also creates some differences because the, uh, you know, due to the overfishing of the lagoon, there is need for those fishers to go towards outer lagoon. And if we were to encourage women to go there, there is need to consider this aspect also. So some outcomes. Um, so women uh, are to take care of, of children and, and manage home affairs, same as Mauritius. But um, there is a trend that has been observed. Many women or mo many more women are interested and in, uh, involved within the fishery, fishing out inside and outside the lagoon. In fact, this observation of women fishing octopus has been the case for the past 10, 20 years. But now there is more interest for women to go towards outer lagoon fishery. So this has already been explained. And um, also um, the difference between Mauritius and Rodrigues is that uh, the fishers, the way they go out at sea is they embark three to four fishers within the same vessel, and within the same pirogue, uh, where we have more pirogue, and they share the course among themselves. And uh, in Rodrigues, when, when this um, activity was carried out, we also had a pool of fishmongers and a majority of those fishmongers were, were women processors. So we could see uh, women, we, 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 met, we had this uh, opportunity to meet with women who are directly involved in post-harvest processing. And they are, they are the one who are kind of making the money out of post-harvest post -harvest processing whereby they are uh, stay, they stays on the on the shoreline and doing the value addition to the uh, fish commodities. So all of these are the various, um, is a summary about the findings. I've uh, gone through almost all of them. And uh, I've already spoke about the fish, women fishmongers, uh, which will bring us to the second uh, component of uh, I mean, a summary of, of the findings. I won't go into much detail, but one, one very important um, uh, output of this uh, activity is the development of the gender action plan. I've explained earlier what we have been uh, with analyz analyzing. We did this uh, gender analysis, and from those uh, analysis, we developed the gender uh, and youth action plan. And this gender and youth action plan is now helping us to mainstream gender and youth, I mean, women and youth involvement within the various activities. And uh, one, for example, uh, what we've noticed within the uh, fish activity cell, I mean, going out at sea, even though we are pushing to have more women involvement, sometimes it's very, it's not obvious because of, uh, you know, the condition in the outer lagoon is not uh, or it's not so favorable as within the lagoon. 
and also we have the security aspect. But within the post-harvest processing itself, that's where we uh, are seeing more women who are interested within the sector. So out of this, we have been developing a set of recommendations. First of all, is to have a gender and youth sensitive, sensitive monitoring and evaluation framework as within the, the project management um, at project management level, and also to have disaggregated data collected according to gender to, to surface the roles and responsibilities. It's very important to get those disaggregated data to showcase about to showcase more about women involvement and also what women and youth are bringing within this uh, particular sector. There is also a, um, a need to have more women and youth inclusivity within the decision making process. That's very important because if there is no such involvement, unfortunately, uh, it, it may be difficult to mainstream all uh, to mainstream gender and youth throughout all the process. So this is it that I had to, to share with you this morning. I'll be glad to answer to any question that you may have later on. Thank you very much and over to you. Thank you, Mr. Azi. Uh, so now the last, uh, but not the least presenter is uh, Mr. Raj Mohabia, officer in charge of the Indian Ocean Commission Mauritius. He will uh, talk to us about uh, maritime security and what OIC does, IOC. <laughs> so, Thank you very much. Um, can I get the presentation, please? Okay. Um, next slide, please. Now, ah, okay, it's me. See. Okay. Bye -bye. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to refer to the paper that has been circulated to to us all where we have the program for the day today, and uh, we have an abstract of what is the objective uh, and the expected outcome of this event. And I think it's very important for us to look at the, the gist of why we are here based on what has been circulated by the organizers. And, uh, and I'm sorry, I I'm, I'm, uh, forgot to thank MRIC. I forgot to thank all those who've been involved in uh, organizing uh, this uh, um, very important uh, national stakeholders uh, workshop. So first of all, um, quantification of the extent of legal NIU fishing. Um, a key issue, a key issue on which I, my very strong opinion is that uh, we don't really have a good estimation of IU fishing uh, anywhere especially uh, pelagic fishing. We know how much is being caught, approximately. We know uh, what's the stock level, approximately. But in terms of the level of IU fishing, I think it's a, it's a major issue. If you like, if you want to find a real good source of the level of IU fishing, um, I, I think you'll continue to f to look for it and, and, and won't find it. But more importantly, I think I think the question that we have to ask, and I would like to invite you in the afternoon to initiate initiate not to have a working group because I don't believe you will be able to uh, work on it fully. To initiate a working group at national level as to why we should focus on IU fishing. Uh, I'll be very blunt to, to tell you that I get the impression that we are focusing on IU fishing because it's a sort of an agenda that is being pushed on us. Why should we look at IU fishing? Because our resources are being lost. But more importantly, uh, in 2005, I initiated a study at regional level. And what we found out that in terms of fishing and fishing resources, the benefits accrue to this region to a maximum of 
seven to eight percent. So why don't we have a focus on how the resources in this region are benefiting the region? Why should we focus on IU fishing? Is it that the overall burden of the IU fishing and surveillance of the fish should be thrown onto the countries in this region? Why? When we are benefiting very little from those resources. This in itself should be a major chunk of our work from each country and at regional level. Second point, prosecution. Mauritius, how many vessels for are you fishing here has prosecuted for the last 25 years? Any guess? And why? You should initiate a working group on this as well. There are only, I think, if I'm not mistaken, only four vessels prosecuted. Now, how many Madagascar have done? How many Comoros? How many other countries in this region? Why is it that we are not able to prosecute IU fishers? If it's a major issue, lots of resources, millions or billions of uh, uh, dollars are being thrown into, and we are not able to shoot. Why? Restoration of marine life and fish stocks. Yes, indeed. Uh, in the presentation, the first presentation that was made, it's very key. We have to understand the stocks. Now, I think here again, there should be a working group. Why is it, where are we with respect to each of the different stocks? Serious analysis, not guesstimates. What are each of the resources where we are? And I think that the example of Rodriguez on octopus fish that was initiated in the mid-2000, uh, in 2010, 2012, 13, 15, is an example. What is that we should do? This is very key and very important. And what would be, should be, and would be <clears throat> the event. The fourth one is the economic recovery from fisheries practices and mercial. I don't know what it means, but yeah, okay, I have a working group on this one. So I would invite you to look at these as working groups. Now, the other point that is the project aims at tapping on innovative technologies. This is a major issue. Technology is very expensive. Latest technology is very expensive. And not just technology, it's also information. And there is a tendency from major international firms to keep the information and the technology with them and make it very expensive. So, a working group on this one. Classify ship types and detect dark ships. <clears throat> now, I, I won't go into that. I will come to that one later. The innovation, innovative tool, pred uh, prediction tool would be shared with the motion authorities. Well, this is key. We have projects now and then. I would invite you, I don't know who will do that, at some point in time, there was a ministry called Ministry of Economic Planning and Development in Mauritius. You could have tasked that ministry to look at all the various projects, what are the outcomes, and how this is being used, and eventually the value of those projects. I would like to see to it that that particular tool that will be developed when we, I understand the project is 24 months, it has started in July last year, it means that we've already nearly done one year. So the tool will be available July next year. We would like to test it. And I, from the IOC, uh, I'm in charge for my time security amongst other things. I'd be very interested in uh, discussing with the University of Surrey to look at the, the issue of the different tools. So um, let's now go to my the gist of my presentation. I thought it's very important for us to look at the basis for why we are here is, uh, before going into what I would like to see. First of all, uh, why are we interested in my time security? But the theme for me is to talk to you about my time security. Why should we interest, get interest in my time security? Simple reason. All the countries in the region want to develop blue economy, Mauritius as well. So if you want to develop blue economy, how can you go in the sea, undertake activities, but you're not sure whether the sea is secure. This is something else, uh, what security means. But if you look at the development of the blue economy as a precondition, 
my damn security, then you have to ask also, um, when we're talking about are you fishing, it is from the sea. When you're talking about drugs entering Mauritius, it's from the sea. When you're talking about all sorts of transboundary organized crimes, like arms, if you look at, for example, the UN in its report a few years back says that 2 billion, 2 billion, not million, 2 billion light arms enter Africa every year. So <clears throat> these are the things. I won't go into the details because uh, it can be long. And the point that we are also making is that the international community as well should in, be interested in my time security. You've seen the case with piracy, for example, the whole international community, uh, you know, came together to deal with piracy. <clears throat> but also, if you look at uh, the situation of Mauritius, if you look at all the um, uh, the the the, um, the routes, uh, maritime routes, uh, you'll see that we are very well situated. Uh, if you look at all the different resources, uh, I won't go into the details because that in itself also is very important because, and this is something that I've been saying every now and then, fish is, um, I mean, people, humans have been living on fish since humanity started, no? Uh, we say what fish is, the, 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 the um, fishing is the one of the most ancient. When I say the most ancient, people say, no, it's the second most ancient. The most ancient is some other profession. So second most ancient um, um, activity of humankind. But how many of us in Africa, in the region, and Mauritius are able to extract from the sea in terms of fish? Why is it so? If we are not able to really tap all the fish that we have, all the resources that we have at sea, who will tap it? Who has the technology to do it? Who has the capacity to do it? Not us, not Mauritius, not the countries in this region. So it is in the international community's interest to see to it that <clears throat> maritime security is there. Now, what is that we are doing in maritime security? What we are saying is that at the end of the day, uh, most of the challenges and ensuring maritime security revolves around how we are able to um, um, uh, observe and analyze the movement of vessels. You take any particular problem, fishing, I've been hearing about VMS, etc. If you're able to track the movement of the vessels where they are, then most of the problems you can deal with. And this is what exactly we're looking at in, the, in, 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 in at IOC from the maritime security perspective, focus on the movement of vessels, and then identify abnormal movement of vessels. I'll show you in my presentation a few of these kind of need. <clears throat> I won't go into the details. If you're interested, you can go in the website of the IOC to understand what this is about. It's about a, a regional agreement, two agreements that have been um, signed by countries in this region to work on and two centers have been established, the Maritime Regional Maritime Information Fusion Center and the RCOC, I'll go into the details of what they do. So in, in other words, what they do is that not just satellite imagery, but there are all sorts of information that are fused in the Regional Maritime Information Fusion Center, which helps to understand the movement of the vessels and the abnormal movement of vessels are identified, and then you go and inspect those vessels. That's what it is about in simple terms. And there are regional centers and national centers as well. I, I won't go into the detail. I don't, I don't want to um, um, put too much of, 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 uh, of technicalities, but I'd like to go into what we've been trying to say is that the tendency is to try to focus on the problem. You know, we have IU fishing. So a system for IU fishing. Since three, four decades, we've been working on that one. And then you have marine pollution. I heard that the minister mentioned about that in the morning in his speech. And then you have oil pollution. And then you have arm trafficking. And then you have uh, drug trafficking. And then you have wildlife trafficking, all sorts of traffic. But all of them in common is the movement of the vessels. Now, if you look at several cases, you'll go and analyze, you'll see that you know, 
like for example, in the very known case, the biggest seizure of drug in Mauritius, that person had, I think, 10 or 11 licenses for fish. So you're looking for fish and you're trying to look at are you fishing, but you're not able to assess whether it is are you fishing, but the guy is doing something else. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that the different crime studies organized, you can't be having one strategy just for looking at uh, are you fishing only, unless you have a comprehensive integrated mechanism to look at all. The problem now is that in the public sector, the responsibilities for addressing these challenges are so much a portion among various ministries and departments that at the end of the day, you're not able to deal with even are you fishing well. That's what the reason is. And each department has the mandate and authority to keep the information for its own. So unless you have a, a coordinated system, including involving all the key departments concerned and to work and exchange among themselves and develop a strategy, will not go far. I'm sorry for that, that will not go far. Uh, now I'll give you a few examples of what we mean and what you're trying to do in terms of uh, maritime security to deal also with uh, uh, are you fishing. You see, I've removed some of the very sensitive information and I've told uh, MRIC not to circulate this, uh, uh, this uh, presentation of mine because it has very sensitive information about particular vessels. These are real cases. Now, if you look at in this uh, uh, slide, there is the details of all the details of a particular vessel you can get. That's, that's the system in Madagascar, it does that. This comes from there. So when you track that particular vessel, you'll see that on the 26th of February, after some time of tracking that vessel, you'll see that that vessel comes from the north of Mozambique it cut, cuts across six EZs and it goes and comes back. It goes and it comes back. Now, on paper, it seems to be that it has a fishing, you know, uh, what's called um, uh, um, uh, deep sea fishing, not, not, not deep sea fishing, but for tourists, you know, it's kind of fishing, uh, marlin fishing, all other things. But these kind of things they're supposed to do. Now, exactly. Now, the simplest, thing would have been that the center based in Madagascar links with the fisheries surveillance officer of each of the countries whose EZ is concerned and checks with them whether that particular vessel is precisely doing fishing or what, or it does something else. I'll give you another example. Three vessels on a hotspot. It gets in and out of Mauritius EZ. It's get in and out of uh, EZ, but you won't find it from there because the, the, um, um, the, the, the image is, is too small. But you see it's, it stays here. It stays here. You can see the EZ where it is. And most of the fishing vessels or vessels doing funny things, they are in particular areas where they shut off their AIS and then goes. Now, I'd like to come to one of the points that was made in the presentation earlier. A vessel can put off its VMS, but it has to put it on when it reaches a port. Think over it very well. In other words, what I'm trying to say here is that, I'm sorry, but we do have enough in terms of technology to achieve what we want to achieve. We are not doing. I maintain that we are not doing what we should do in order to address most of the maritime crime issues. Now, we can go uh, further. There are other vessels. It is supposed to be a fishing vessel. No flag, no name, no MSIRI. For 30 days, it is on the same stop, uh, spot. Why? And you'll see where it is. It is just on the border of the uh, EZs. <clears throat> we can take examples of every single vessel everywhere. And I can give you 
list, long list of vessels, what they're doing. <laughs> I won't be here, <clears throat> sorry, for the whole day. We are organizing a, another similar exercise, but with other countries in this region, all the IOC countries, Kenya, Mozambique, um, and, you know, Kenya, Djibouti, and the others with traffic. I don't know if you're here about it. And we are talking about wildlife traffic um, we, today and tomorrow. So I'll be there. But my colleague who works with me is, the, is here. Can you just stand up, please? Uh, he's a superintendent of police, Utam uh, Ganesh. He is based in the center in, in Seychelles. He will be there. He knows uh, even more than me what, what we are doing, dealing with what we are doing. So he can give you some gist if you're interested in the working groups in the afternoon. Now, I wanted to uh, come to one point. After, you know, the two agreements were signed by seven countries in 2018, and in, 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 um, uh, after two years, uh, last year we decided, I decided that we should try to uh, um, um, generate some interest from countries to try to do certain things. So what we did is that we um, identified the Saad Malha Bank, as you all know, there is, we, we, this is what we call the joint management area of Mauritius and Seychelles, which is shared 396 square kilometers of, of the sea, uh, the continental zone. And the reason why is because the, the, the point that is, is made there. What I'm trying to say, just because I asked the first question, and why do you need and what to address are you fishing? Please be clear about it. For me, it's not clear. But why do you need to look at and to understand what's happening in the your EZ is clear. Unless and until you don't have a mechanism to do a good surveillance of the EZ, you cannot claim, you cannot say that you have full sovereignty in your own waters. As simple as that. Now, the GMA, is Mauritius and Seychelles. Now, there, apart from the fact of claiming and ensuring and, you know, really uh, having your own sovereignty on this, but there are other reasons as well. There are certain creatures that we don't know about it, you know, pygmy blue whale breed in that area. You have the deep water surrounded of very rich in nutrients. You have the there are world largest seagrass meadows. All these are very important for the ocean's health, for the oceans, uh, 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 the, not just the health, but also uh, quite another thing. So we, we, we look at that for just a few months. And what we found, we had identified, based on the information that we get, at least 70 vessels of interest. So it means that at least 70 vessels were contravening IMO rules and regulations. And these are the contraventions, which we have checked, cross-checked, and then verified. But we can't do anything. Why we can't do anything? Please look at it. Uh, in a working group. <laughs> if you're interested, let's let's discuss. Uh, sorry. Where were, are we? So I, uh, because I have only 15 minutes, I couldn't go into the details and explaining to what exactly we're doing. But what I'm trying to tell you is that we already have an architecture for maritime security, which enables to focus on the abnormal movement of vessels, identify them, and then get to check those vessels. And we are doing it already. The same thing can be done for IU fishing. And it's very simple. Since February 2014, we have the regional VMS. The VMS, you know, it's very simple. Mauritius has given how many licenses to who? Each of the licenses that Mauritius has given, you have to have, and it is compulsory, all the countries have agreed to do that, to ensure that the VMS will be on permanently when they are in the EZ. Fine. But there is also an agreement amongst all the countries in the region that this VMS will be on. And we've also agreed to have a regional VMS. 
What it means, it means simply that you do on a permanent basis, on a day-to-day -day basis, you look at the VMS of each of the vessels, and it's very simple. The VMS says where you are, what is that you are catching, how much you are catching, and do a reconciliation of what licenses you've given, what is that you see. Do it at national level, do it at regional level. We have it since February 2014, eight years after. We do not have a single report, neither at national level nor at regional level. So the, what we are suggesting right now is that all the countries agree that the regional VMS is tagged to the regional Maritime Information Fusion Center. In, a, in other words, we, have, we will have it on a day-to-day -day basis. The details of it, uh, I'll, I'll explain later. And that idea is, uh, this is something what I have in, in, invented to say that, you know, what is very important is that we have to send the signal to anyone using the sea. Because right now, anyone using the sea is free to do whatever it wants. We have international conventions. Yes, so what? Wakasho came. Wakasho did whatever it did. Can someone tell me what any of the international convention has helped Mauritius on the basis of that international convention to go and claim something? It would be good to have a working session on that one as well. So that's my presentation. It was, I, I tried to be very short because, but then this is a very complex uh, subject. Um, it, it in itself, it requires uh, loads of work. I have been working on that for several years and I'll be very happy to interact with you. As I said, in the afternoon while you're working, um, Superintendent of Police, uh, Mr. Ganesh Uttam will be here to respond to any of the questions that you can have. But if you have any questions right now, I can answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moabia. Thank you to all the speakers for these very enlightening uh, speeches. We'll take some five minutes to answer any questions that uh, we have. Maybe uh, if uh, we have any questions in the audience. Else, uh, we have uh, also some questions from Slido. Uh, from the audience, do we have any questions? No, I think we are all hungry. Uh, there was one question on uh, Slido. How many have been fined under the new regulations and legislation? Any Anyone wants to intervene? I think, yeah, I think it was your, your presentation. Can we? Can, can. So, yes, so, yeah. better, yeah, now, yeah, now it's working, yeah, so the, the question was, Question was how many have been fined under the new regulation? It's can you repeat the question and then yeah, it would be easier. Question. So the question is from anonymous uh, audience: How many have been fined under the new regulations slash uh, slash legislation? For me to understand uh, answer this question, I would need some more context because. See, we can't find the fishing vessel. We find the fishing operator. Well, it means that there's a person who is responsible for the fishing vessel that comes to Mauritius and fishes in our waters. The obligation to respect regulations and any uh, legislation, I mean, just so, is on the onus of this fishing operator. He, he may be local, he may be uh, foreign, but as we do in the ministry, we overlook we oversee any kind of uh, sanctions that are applicable on those fishing operators that do not abide to their fishing licenses. Because as soon as a fishing license is issued by the ministry, there are some 24 to 50 terms and uh, conditions that are applicable on the fishing vessels. And this differs, this varies as per the fishing 
type of fishery that the fishing vessel uh, undergoes in our waters. Tricky to answer this question because since the new regulation has been gone through, it's not even three months. So not enough time for us to uh, apply this regulation to the new vessels that are being uh, carried out, uh, carrying out operations in our waters. But on the other regulation that has been in operation in force since 2005, there are some 15 vessels and operators that have been prosecuted by the ministry. Thank for, you. Uh, for the fines, you have to uh, ask uh, the prosecution unit because we all we only report what we see as um, suspicious behavior and we flag this uh, observation that we have. And then the, pr the prosecution unit of the ministry goes towards prosecution of the vessel or the agent. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question, I think, online. Can you repeat it, uh, Pawan? If we are able to identify over 70 vessels that are I IUU, why can't actions be taken against them? Yeah. Yes, from you. <clears throat> no, no, I haven't said 70 vessels are you, but I said 70 vessels VOI. It means that they are doing things that are very suspicious. That it means. Now, why can't we act on them? Simple. The legal base is not there. Uh, if you want to, I can explain, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I think... Um, uh, any any questions from the audience? Avinash. Um, I have uh, one simple practical question. I don't know anything about maritime surveillance. I'm a computer scientist. Which is 2,000 kilometers square, and we have thousands and thousands of cameras to make sure to know what is happening within the country. Here we are talking about 2.3 million square kilometers. How does it work? Can it work? Anybody wants to answer? <laughs> yes, yes, it can work. How? But if you want to, we can get into the details. Uh, if you have time, if you, have, you don't want lunch, we have one hour, two hours. No, it's it's there. The system is there. In fact, there are now uh, various uh, international um, agencies, private sector. They are working on uh, systems where you, uh, you know, for example, um, the AIS, all vessels uh, emit. There are now companies which tap these AIS and then they can sell it to you. Okay, now um, the only difference is that the AIS, which which is in your maritime territory, this they can't use. This is your own, but the rest you can use. So, but there is not just that. There are a, a series of of uh, tools that you you can use, and then you can um, you know um, uh, do and monitor the movement of the vessel. Now, don't forget also that there are rules of the IMO that vessels should have the AIS on, et cetera, et cetera. The issue about VMS is AIS, but the only thing is that the difference is that it has additional functionalities where you can not just know where it is, but also you can, if you have the conditions set, know what they are fishing and where they are fishing. They're supposed to report permanently. No, the technology is there. The technology is at our hand. But the problem is those technology are being kept either very expensive, but more importantly, according to me, and that's why I'm suggesting that have a working group of the different departments concerned and sit on that particular issue and discuss that. Um, I, I, you know, I think that if I'm doing my job at the IOC and nothing pushes me to do more. Why should I do more? On the contrary, if you do more, you'll be criticized and you'll pay the brunt for that. If I'm saying that since eight years, there is a regional VMS, there is not a single report until now. I'm attracting criticism from everywhere, including from Mauritius departments. 
I'm asking the Mauritius Ministry of Fisheries, you have VMS. Where is your report on the VMS for the last decades or so? Why don't you do reconciliation of these other lease licenses? This is where you fished. This is what you fished. And this is the report. Why? So don't ask me to say more. What I'm saying is that you can do much more with the actual technologies that you have. But if you want to meet to say more, then I'm looking for trouble. Thank you. Uh, I, I think we, yes, Rafaela. Specific comment um, on radar technology. I think it should be uh, fair to say that we can't cover in one shot your exclusive economic zone because it's really, really wide. Um, and at the moment, what we are doing is really concentrating on specific areas where from preliminary data, we know illegal fishing is more likely to happen. But it's exactly one of the feedback we need to receive is are we looking at one of priority areas for you? But we do have a space technology and constellation coming uh, that will cover the earth more quickly and more often. So one of the things we want to do with the nearest and as part of the discussion of all space agendas in MRC, but everywhere in the world, is really how this service can be automated in early real time. Because to be in early real time, it really means that you download data, you process it quickly, and then you inform the authorities about what's happening. So space coverage is a problem, but time is another one. All right, so I think uh, we will end this session here. So uh, before uh, inviting you to lunch, uh, I would wish to invite everybody to stay after lunch. We have four interesting uh, topics where we would like uh, uh, all of you to participate. So the topic one is the tools and technical specifications about the, the nearest uh, project. So it will be here in this room. So all those interested in discussing around the technicalities, the technical specifications, please come back here in this room. For those who are interested in fishing activities of a fish species and uh, sustainability indicators, the second discussion group will be in the Olympia, which is downstairs. It is the, uh, we have already uh, the setup there. The third one, uh, economic and environmental impact of uh, fishing activities and IUU. It will be in the globe, which is another uh, breakout uh, room uh, downstairs. And the last one, gender analysis in the context of fishing. It will be in the Shunya uh, group. So each group, uh, each room, will we will have one of our facilitators to guide you. And Rafaela and uh, Max will be walking around during the sessions to uh, sort of prompt and, and discuss. We have a series of questions uh, for those who are online. You can join us uh, with Slido and respond in our, uh, to, to the questions asked. And uh, you can even ask more questions. So we will try to take as many questions as we can in the different uh, sessions. So I will end uh, this session here and I will invite you all for lunch. So let's uh, be back here at uh, in, let's say, one hour's time, 1.30. Thank you very much. The lunch is served downstairs.
Uh, we can be more relaxed if we sort of rearrange the group. On the other, in the other rooms, they had working tables. So uh, I don't know if you, you sort of venir devant et remettre les, les chaises uh, autour. Um, Adam, tu peux mettre ta première workshop là. Tu n'as pas de question là, non? Ça nous fait banal. Ouais. <coughs> Yeah, so do we have uh, a, do, do you have something to write or a poem? So this is uh, the working group on the tools and technical specifications. So we have uh, seen we have uh, seen the different topics and uh, um, the idea here is to get feedbacks from you. So uh, maybe Max. Uh, if you would like uh, to to share your thoughts with uh, our group of people here, and then um, then you can we can we have a series of questions which will help us sort of lead the discussions. So maybe before we we uh, start, let us see if we can uh, briefly introduce ourselves. Do you have the floating mic? Yeah. Okay, so uh, please pass on. So we will see the different interveners. So thank you for, for coming uh, in such a, a large group. So we are slowly getting set. So let us start, yes. Hi everybody, I'm Maya Lila, a lead professional in the ICT department of Economic Development Board. Hello, I'm Vikas Khanna, I'm from uh, CIO for MTEL. Hello, everyone. I'm Minakshi Gantram, Food and Food Coordinator at the MEXA. Hello, everyone. I'm Yashir from the ICT Authority. Hello, this is Yanish Sivasatsang, uh, engineer at the ICT Authority. Yeah, maybe one word on what you, you, your different organizations do for, for the better uh, benefit of the audience, which are listening to us and who don't know necessarily what ICT. So we heard the EDB, uh, Economic Development Board, who looks after the, uh, maybe I'll, I'll let, let's, let's take two. <laughs> One word on uh, who you are and what does your organization do? Uh, Thank after you. the EDB, we, we are the Apex uh, Trade and Investment Organization. And we also work in close collaboration with the Ministry of Finance for economic development and policy and all uh, related uh, policy matters. Thank you. Uh, MTEL, you know, we provide telecommunication services. Uh, MEXA is the Mauritius Export Association and represents uh, the largest export companies of Mauritius. And we work in close collaboration with the Ministry of Blue Economy as well. Thank you. Yes, so the ICT Authority is the regulator of the ICT sector in Mauritius. And uh, for this specific workshop, uh, I'd like to emphasize that uh, the ICTA, we uh, assign the cosine and MMSI for the various vessels in Mauritius. I'm uh, Sukhdev Rangu from the Rajiv Gandhi Science Center. The center uh, promotes STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in Mauritius. Um, Mr. Kharagas, I am not in the field of electoral, uh, I am from college, previous SS, but uh, I am in, in, in the field of electronic for 30 years, and I'm interested in satellites. I have just followed the course from uh, MIC at uh, for the, uh, on the satellite. Yeah. Uh, 
just just to add uh, the MRIC in the same vein as the, the first Russian uh, satellite and in order to incite uh, new uh, people, students to look into space and satellite technology as a future career. We uh, did, we launched a satellite training program where students from secondary schools, from universities got to build their own basic antenna and capture space uh, uh, imagery. So, and uh, uh, Trillia SSS was one of the schools. Yes. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Pr Yara Gunat, Veterinary Officer at the Competent Authority, Seafood. I am uh, responsible for the certification of fish and fish products for export. My area of expertise is uh, veterinary epidemiology and public health. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we knew Ms. Garia, but still for others who didn't. For, for people uh, all around who've just joined us, Ms. Garia at the Ministry of Fisheries posted at the FMC, who works on the VMS 24-7. Hi, uh, this is Dr. Manbin Singh. I'm from Mar Mauritius Oceanography Institute, principal research scientist. We are into research field of oceanographic, ocean, ocean research. Good afternoon, I'm Shamila Mahmoud. I work for the Department of Continental Shelf, Maritime Zones Administration and Exploration, that is CSMZE for short. Um, the department looks at the delineation and the limitation of the maritime zones in the Mauritius, and also we look at non-living resources in the maritime zones. Thank you. Hello everyone, I am Sivani, Research Development Officer from the Department for Continental Shelf, Maritime Zone Administration and Exploration. As she has already mentioned, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I, I'm I'm Mr. Sandy from the Mauritius Has my has my Mr. Manuel Singh has already described the Mauritius Institute and different types of work that is research in remote sensing, we can say, and also in physical sonography and biological anything that concerns the ocean in general. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Inspector Gisau from the National Coast Guard. And I work uh, mostly on board ship on the uh, sailing platform, which goes at sea for the uh, surveillance. And occasionally also I work at the uh, uh, OPS room, NCG OPS room, where we monitor these uh, AIS activities on the other platform like Sea Vision. And also we already have uh, one uh, output connection from the VMS also, which the fisheries are uh, looking after. And we use this tool also to carry out our duties. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Francois Young from Moss, Mauritius Amateur Radio Society. <clears throat> Hello, good evening. I'm Patrick Rangami from uh, uh, Moss, Mauritius Amateur Radio Society. Uh, we are interested in uh, communication field. That is, uh, we've been closely uh, uh, with uh, our friend from MRIC in the MIASAT uh, program and also in uh, uh, the uh, helping in the program of the school uh, for preparing those uh, uh, receiving uh, uh, antennas and all. Yeah, yeah. so uh, again, as I said, uh, we work in close collaboration with uh, MAS for the school training program. Yes, thank you. Thanks, uh, Ajila, also a representative from Moss, and uh, I'll add to what Patrick said. So Moss has been a hobby, but uh, still we are collaborating with MRIC for uh, educational outreach in STEM, and uh, uh, the last uh, project was the antenna for the uh, uh, for the schools and secondary schools, and perhaps in near future, uh, new uh, programs and our new programs uh, is emerging and. Uh, Hopefully, I will collaborate uh, with MRIC. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Shiksha Jaisiri. I'm uh, an MPhil uh, PhD student at the University of Mauritius, uh, Department of Physics. Um, we are a small group of six students right now at the department. We are called Dara Scholars because we got a scholarship from Leeds University. And we do various uh, um, projects uh, uh, related to astronomy, but my project is related to object detection, mostly ship uh, in the EZ of Mauritius, and uh, I've been using neural network to do so. Uh, that's it. 
Okay, thank you. So I'm just informed that uh, uh, there are uh, some still some places in the gender group. Uh, those of you willing to join in the gender group, please uh, uh, move downstairs at the Shunya. So there are, um, we, we will need some people, some inputs from you uh, there. So please, uh, if uh, uh, it would be nice of you if some of you could join the, this group. Uh, so how it is going to, to, to go, we have uh, uh, defined a series of questions and we would like first uh, to choose one rapporteur and someone who would lead the discussions. So we will need volunteers <laughs> uh, who would, uh, well, we will need the one who will lead and the other one will take some notes. Uh, else my, my colleagues, are you taking notes? Yes, okay. So for the rapporteur is okay. We will need someone to lead the, uh, Vikas? Okay, Vikas will lead the question. Maybe, Rafaela, you can give us an overview of what is expected from this group, and then we will move down to the other. Yeah. Oh, very quickly, because it's important that we use the time wisely. Um, so all the different sessions are, have been organized around the key questions on things that we need to understand to make sure that the tool we prepare yeah, does work for you as you like, because we, as I said, we don't want this top-down approach. So we did start because in the timeline of the project, this workshop came later than expected, just because the UNDP awarded later. So we needed to start and we have acquired data, serrated data on areas that we know are important for illegal fishing. But we do need to confirm some information to validate some of our beliefs because it is still possible to change some of the decisions we made. So you do have some questions here. And I do hope that the people decided to go in a group or another because they believe is the group they can most contribute to. If you don't think it's the right group for you, I would recommend you to change it now before we need the discussion. But do really join the group where you think you can have your say and help us with the uh, definition of some tech aspects for the, the project. So some questions are about general understanding about how this data are used in Mauritius. And we had very useful talks this morning that already gave us an understanding. So if you could have an, a discussion about all these different questions, trying to get an answer to us that is concise, so it doesn't need to have a brainstorm session on every single question. So if the answer is already there, go for that. If there are different opinions, do share these opinions, and then maybe we could, the rapporteur can help us in collecting the main points. Right. So that's mainly what we expect from this session. Uh, so. Um... Okay. Okay. okay, so uh, Vikas, would you like to come in and uh, so basically it's for us to brainstorm. We have some questions and let's try to go through them very quickly. And then if you have other inputs, please feel free to do so. We will move downstairs and come back. Uh, so, thank you everyone and thank you Dr. Vishwanath. Uh, so, before we start the first question, how does the Ministry of Blue Economy determine suspicious activity from VMS? Uh, just for the everyone, everybody knows what is VMS. You all know? Oh. You want to just... Everyone talking about the tools, but what is the tools is about it? No one knows what is the tools. Yeah. No, no, that is there's someone from MRC. Okay, let's go step by step. Agreed, agreed. Yeah, so let's. Okay, 
I think uh, let's uh, start from the point with someone wants to go through what is VMS. Just explain. <laughs> So VMS stands for Vessel Monitoring uh, System. Yeah. So it's a uh, data that the ship send. It sends like its longitude, latitude, its name, where it comes from, etc. What's its purpose? Where, uh, which port will it go next? This kind of data is collected, and normally uh, it sends it to authorities or maybe I don't know. I don't know exactly, but I know it's data from ships that are sent to authorities or. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, I, I think the question was directed towards how does the Ministry of the Economy determine suspicious activity? Anyone wants to start discussion? Yeah, maybe who better than you? Actually, the person better than me would be the person prosecuting the, the vessels. But what I do is I flag the incident as i uh, see any as i see in okay as i see any suspicious activity from the vms data as such vessels are supposed to be reporting as per the regulation assessed on them since 2005 so that means that any vessel that is licensed with Mauritius should be reporting every one hour or two hours as per the conditions on clear paper on their fishing license. Every op operator has in their possession this fishing license and they are aware clearly of what time of terms and conditions they should abide to. So the ministry as they see any anomaly as per the conditions, any break in the regulations that is being imposed. This is when the ministry is going to go towards uh, maybe sanctions or, of course, before sanctions, we'll ask for justification or reasoning for this type of behavior or event. And if they are not able to really sustain this activity to uh, explain to us with reasonable doubt what happened in during this time and um, this region because what we see is as rightly mentioned by the uh, my uh, former i think uh, you, you're a student of the ufc motion so i i was at the ufc motion myself so um what we do see is data only data. We interpret data as per instance in the past and as per incidents that we see every day. If we see a vessel that has ceased monitoring, uh, ceased reporting from X hour, maybe 5 uh, a.m. in the morning, and is still not reporting, say, uh, 10 a.m. in the same morning, we will flag this issue. My colleague from the NCG will be made aware. The, we don't have AIS, was one uh, main point that I, sh I should flag, is that the ministry didn't have AIS and it's only with the NCG that they have it. So we will try to communicate. We will uh, open a channel of communication regarding the vessel that hasn't been reporting since 5 a.m. And we will try to exchange information on this type of vessel because what we see is data, the vessel name, the vessel position, the direction that it was heading into, and of course the speed, which is all relevant information for us to identify what kind of behavior, what kind of activity the vessel is doing and was going towards to. So this is this is firstly to assess the situation and then we will query them. Query them, I mean, we'll create the, the phishing of, uh, operator. Thank you. Thank you. So you would like to add something? So I said uh, that uh, AIS information is very uh, useful, uh, which uh, NCG combines with the VMS also. But of course, the phishing vessel, sometimes they, they don't uh, use VMS. They use only uh, some AIS. But uh, in our territory, uh, they are supposed to be using the VMS also. But uh, combining this uh, information regarding the course, the speed, and the uh, and the direction, and the position there, 
So we can make out that uh, the vessel is is moving, is having some activities or or doing some something uh, which is maybe illegal also. If they switch on their switch off their system, which they are not supposed to switch off, right? And uh, we can categorize also different uh, a movement or different uh, activity, like two vessel coming together, staying for some time. We might think that there is something uh, suspicious going on. So in that case, sometimes we uh, communicate with the vessel. If we know the agent in Mauritius, we know the emails. So we send them emails also, so that we communicate with the vessel to ask about his intention. Especially maybe sometimes they are doing uh, innocent passage or they are going to for, for, for fishing. That depends also. So in that, uh, we do inquire in that also. Yeah. Depending on the AIS information we receive. Yeah. So you want to ask? Yeah. I wanted to ask a question about uh, you said the suspicious activity. Apart from non reporting of position, what are the activities that you consider as suspicious? On the license conditions of any type of vessel, say for example, for a case study for you to understand, a vessel, a long liner, uh, maybe national flag, like uh, registered in Mauritius, they are allowed to fish in certain regions, the fishing grounds only. And they are, as per license, able to fish on Saint-Brandon Ban or maybe Nazareth Ban, Ban de Nazareth. If we see the vessel that we're monitoring every day going towards maybe Rodrigues, this is highly suspicious to us because they have no business going to towards Rodrigues. This is how we really day to day we monitor the activities of fishery vessels. Uh, thank you. I think uh, we had a good discussion. Anybody else would like to? Yes, please, sir. I, I think one important aspect of uh, VMS, which Mr. Ranami has asked, is uh, it is important to understand that in Mauritius we have two regulations, the AIS regulation and the VMS re regulation. And both of these regulations give uh, the conditions that uh, these vessels ha must have. And any breach of that of that will amount to, a, uh, to an offense. But I think the question is very specific. It's here is, uh, how do we determine suspicious activity from VMS? So, so I think the question was not answered uh, uh, correctly. We were just explaining uh, what we have because uh, I'm working from the from the uh, region uh, in uh, our COC, and this is a major issue uh, with fishing vessel. Uh, the, the the state give a license to fish, whether it is national or foreign, to fish in their waters, and the whole region is like this and. Uh, what Mr. Moabia said in, in, in the morning was about regional VMS. We are trying to push for, for regional VMS, but we realize that uh, at national level, we still have a uh, difficulty to monitor through the VMS. Uh, uh, yeah. is, is there a central place where all these data uh, stored, AIS, VMS? Anybody wants to, to comment on this? I can answer for VMS. So centrally, it is stored on our servers at Albion, VMS. Okay. And for AIS, I guess Coast Guard? You... AIS, Coast Guard? Coast Guard is not having uh, the AIS like uh, we have having some uh, CSOS uh, station where we it is uh, working in conjunction with some AI station which are on the mountains, on the mount like Jurançon, Simonet, uh, Biologic, and so on. And these are AIS, which we monitor, and and uh, we have some data, but the system is going old now. Most of the database is not working properly. So density is in view for replacing all these equipment. But we are ha also having different platform like C-Vision, which are, we are not the owner. We have the access to it. We get the password without access, and we can use the flat platform. So on this platform, so, we can retrieve data, pause data, get track and so on when we log in. So we don't keep the data with us, but we can use the data whenever required. We can log in in the system and try to 
get post trial, any vessel which is has gone uh, through our region. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just, uh, in fact, I've got two questions. The first one um, is about the issuing of licenses. Um, it was mentioned that a suspicious behavior is identified, for instance, when uh, a boat goes towards Rodrigues. So here comes my question. When the Russian government is selling a fishing license to a foreign uh, boat, is it isn't it open to the whole of the Mauritian EZ or are there restricted areas? This is my first question. My second question is, um, you were mentioning about the VMS Center in Albion. Are you operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week? I think my colleague from uh, the I'll take the first part and then uh, you take uh, no, no, the second part. And he, no, no, no. I, I think I take the second part. So we don't. We operate during office hours. We only clocking at uh, eight forty-five and clock out at four, uh, like any uh, the office worker in Mauritius. But the system doesn't sleep. The system uh, gathers data over 24 hours and seven days a week. So this is what we analyze. This is what we monitor, the data the, within office hours. And your first question was uh, uh, asked, fishing license. If they are in the restricted areas, not open to foreign vessels fishing in the Mauritian Museum. There are restricted areas in the inshore waters of the of the Republic of Mauritius, the 50, 40, 75 miles from any uh, coastline of Mauritius. Is the what you you mentioned about twelve, 12 nautical miles? That's the territorial sea. That's the territorial. This is the international measurement territorial waters. No, I think there's some kind of confusion. The 12 nautical miles uh, measured from the base, baseline of Mauritius is up to uh, 12 nautical miles. That You have the, uh, the shelf of Mauritius and you have 12 nautical miles. This is total waters. The EZ extends not limited by 12 nautical miles. It goes maybe beyond uh, 200 nautical miles and encompasses every uh, inshore waters that we have, including the small islands in saint -Rondon. So this is encompassed in our EZ, and this is where our fishing uh, fishing vessels go to fish. So this is my question. Are there, when you, the government issues a fishing license, are there any restricted area besides the coastline? Um, for these vessels, like I mentioned, like 75 miles within the shorelines, yet they are not allowed to fish. Okay, uh, so can we just come back with a question and, and, and one point that was made about this Sea Vision uh, 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 system, which we don't own, but we have access to data as and when we require? I think, uh, yeah. Uh, it is important to understand when TOCA AIS, there are two type of AIS. Uh, the inspector was talking about the CSO system, which has got a coastal AIS, whereas the Sea Vision is a satellite AIS uh, uh, monitoring. So the uh, access to the satellite AIS, it's an American system, which is called Sea Vision, yeah. which uh, we have access to that. And I think uh, most of the countries in the region have access to that, uh, thanks to the uh, US government. But the coastal uh, radar event is only coastal AIS uh, uh, surveillance. So the data they have is, is coastal AIS. So it's important to, to, to mention that. Yes. And and the license that are issued, uh, this is why I say there are two regulations, uh, the VMS and, and AIS regulation. So the conditions that are mentioned, definitely a foreign vessel cannot fish wherever it wants. And we have uh, control on our EZ. So all these vessels, whenever they leave or enter our EZ, they have to notify the Coast Guard or the authorities. But definitely, they cannot. They, they, there is certain places where they cannot mention, and she mentioned clearly that seventy-five nautical miles from any of the baseline, they cannot, uh, they cannot fish. Okay, uh, just one point on this. Since you're talking a lot about data, 
I think uh, maybe because there are a lot of, uh, I see the young students also there and uh, from university also. I think we also need to look at how do we uh, mask the, uh, what you say, the confidential data, but make the data set public for the data scientists to look at. And we mark all the confidential data and mask them basically so that there is no leak of information. But the generic data, the lat longs, the, the information, there's a huge amount of data which is available. Obviously, we cannot make it public because there is a confidentiality, but there are ways to mask the data. And then we open it to a broader society to start working on it. For example, when I heard her saying about neural networks, so I don't know um, how easy it is for all the people in your ministry to be trained on the on the on the data science part of predictive analytics, but there are predictive analytics scientists available in Mauritius who can work on this mass data and tell us more insights to something that we are missing. So uh, maybe if we have the past trends of the of the cases which were notified, we take those trends and it is possible. I mean, those who have a basic knowledge of Python, they can tell me. I can tell them they will agree with me that you take those trends and then you put it those trends as a training data and then put a test data to find out more such trends from the vast amount of data. So the idea is if we are keeping everything closed, yes, confidentiality has to be there, but at the same time, we need to mask the data and make a public data set. So this is something to, for the future to look at how we use the big data and the predictive analytics to use this because this is a huge amount of data and you cannot use the old scheme of uh, what do you say programming and finding the anomalies it's impossible if i may tell you if you're trying to use uh, an um, old way of finding which youtube song you will be seeing you will never be able to do it so this is predictive analytics you always see the song which you wanted. You always see the video which you want. That's the power of the prediction. All right, moving on. I think uh, we got this. Can we put the questions, please? Yes, please. Yeah, in line with what you've just mentioned about availability of data, but for the purpose of this project, we will need the data for validation. So if data availability is still an issue which has not been addressed, uh, I would like to ask, how do you plan to go about it? Thank you. I think that's what I said. The, uh, how do we do masking technologies? How do we use with the ministry to mask the data, which is the country, let's say, removing the, the, the identification of the ships, but giving all the other credential. I think that is something the first, exactly. So those who own the data, uh, first thing is to at least see that can we make this data mask data available to a larger set of people and get their expertise. They may not know anything about this entire subject, but they know a huge amount about how the predictive algorithm works. So the data doesn't matter like the, the domain knowledge may not be with them, but they come with the knowledge of models. So this is something we, we need to at least start thinking that how do we make the data set public so that like in the university, you have many brilliant students who can do a lot of analysis and they can find out the trends from the huge amount of data. All right. Okay. Now uh, going to the next current monitoring coverage of the Mauritian EZ with AIS and VMS. We, we touched upon a little bit in your previous question, but I think we'll go a bit more specific now. Does the terrestrial AIS network on Mauritius cover its entire EZ, any other data source such as SST or chlorophyll A? Um, I don't know if, yeah. Yeah, I'll go to the third part. SST and chlorophyll A at MOI, we are already providing three-day forecast for SST and chlorophyll. And it's automatic, it goes through. Uh, okay, sea surface temperature, SST, and chlorophyll is primary productivity, if I'm wrong, if I'm right. 
because I'm not from that background, but we do give this forecast for three days, SST and chlorophyll. And it's automatically, we have been involved in projects like JMES, MESA, which were EU funded through African Union. And in that we are providing this. Maybe Sa Mr. Sadia is not here. He could have given much more better detail about it. Hi. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Actually, in the GMS project, we have been doing several like forecasting also, like it's a forecasting of the sea surface height and SST and the seashell A. Along with this, we have also used the SST data from the Sentinel soil data and the and and and, and the profile. To come, to come up with some project like the potential physics zone. What we, also, what we have planned to do is to use the AS data and the VM data to overlay with the potential physics zone. That is where the fish or potential is there. If we saw some shock, it's definitely off only in this location for about, I don't know how, one day or two days. This, this seems to be a sort of illegal fishing. That is, we put the entire all the data source, it is from the ocean color or the sentinel source data sources. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, I would uh, say that, you know, if uh, I don't know, there is a lot of approvals required, but if some part of these data are made available to university, I think you'll get good insights. The data is freely available and you can download it also. I think you can make a request to MOI. It can be done if you want from MOI. The problem will come for VMS data. As per the regulation of VMS data, you cannot share it with the third party till the consent is not given by the fisher. No, but if you remove the fisher... Sir, I tried it. Trust me, I never got the data. <laughs> to validate our PFZ also, I didn't get. Okay, so so we have... Uh, maybe this is where these... Uh, what do you say? These, uh, these uh, seminars help. At least we all agree. What is the problem? before finding the solution, you see. So today we know that we have a capability in our, our system to look at the data. But uh, as we all know, the both volume and velocity of the data is increasing every day. All right. So, and let me add the third V, which is variety. Volume, variety, and velocity. These three, when they start increasing, Trust me, the old way of programming doesn't work, right? So maybe it's not that we can find the solution, but we, in, in our mind, we know that we need newer ways, newer eyes to look at the same data, right? And obviously, you cannot recruit so many people on ministry or any organization. This is where the uh, larger set which is where universities, this is where people who, who understand technologies come into picture. But let's let's look at it as a one of our key learning that how do we have more people working on the data without getting the confidentiality lost? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll add on. Uh, the, there was uh, one question before. Uh, I, I'll just uh, prompt another question. What is this audience here think about the project proposal that is having a sort of emerged uh, an algorithm that will be merging different types of data and try to give this near real time so we'll have uh, your comments and then from madam good evening and i'm from the MRI technical officer i'm in charge of the narcotic section in the port MRA is the malicious revenue of your authority May I know we are talking about local vessels or foreign vessel about the question. If it is foreign vessel, if the vessel is doing some illegal activities in our zone, he will just switch off the IES and we will not be able to monitor. At the MOA, we have Sea Vision, we have Marine Traffic and over platform Skylight. But if they switch off their AIS, we will not be able to track them. That's all. But at some point in time, they have to come to the port, right? So we cannot. Outside the okay. zone, they can just fish and go back. Okay. We'll do. Point noted. Thank you. 
Um, in fact, thank you for, for, for what you just said. Um, because my, one of the questions I was going to have was about what if AIS and VMS is switched off? Or VMS, well, we would take for granted that it, um, a boat equipped with VMS is has taken a license from the Russian government. So obviously, it wouldn't fall under the eye of IOU fishing. It could be undeclared and reported, but not really illegal. However, um, my question would be, what about those uh, fishing vessels that come to a node in our port and who don't have fishing licenses from Mauritius? Is there any means of controlling where they have been? Have they been appearing on our screens under AIS? And what happens if those vessels have switched off the AIS while entering into Mauritian um, EZ? I believe that from what I've heard, we must be um, our screens will be blind to them because we don't have a proper uh, identification uh, for that. Any anyone um, would like to answer? Yes, Inspector. I think we have to put uh, everything in perspective. You know, the Indian Ocean. On a daily basis, we have approximately 5,000 ships that travel in this ocean. Around 2,500 go down South Mauritius, around 1,500 go in the Mozambique Channel, and rest goes towards the uh, uh, Arabian Seas. Uh, the AIS is only 70% proof. You cannot have monitoring of 100% of ships in the, I'm talking about Indian Ocean, especially. Western Indian Ocean. The concept of VMS, when it came, it was basically for countries that give license to respective uh, uh, fishing vessels. Uh, uh, the questions that, that has been asked, this is why uh, the region intend to go towards regional VMS. What is regional VMS? So on a platform, if you have all this uh, island state, uh, Seychelles, Mauritius, Madagascar, and so on, the data of all the ships that they have given license, then you can do monitoring. Uh, um, Raj Mabia mentioned since 2014, people are fighting about that. There is, uh, the, the, each country doesn't want to share uh, the number of licenses and, and, uh, that they have given. So that is the main difficulty. It's a bureaucratic or at a very strategic level, the country uh, not share. So if you do not share, you don't have data. Uh, and if you don't have data, you cannot monitor. Here in the region, we are talking about system. I believe your system will be an artificial intelligence system. And art artificial intelligence system cannot work if you don't have data. You can feed AIS data. Uh, as per regulation, ships are supposed to have AIS. You can feed VMS data. You can feed LIT data. So all of these data will give some pattern, and the system will identify the pattern. So if we are really in providing data, the system will not uh, produce any result. I'm sorry to say that. All right. Uh, uh, there was one intervention here. So we've been talking about AIS and v VMS, mostly probably because that's the system we are used to uh, in Mauritius. But there's uh, one aspect that we are not covering is saw data. So I don't know how many of us know what is saw data. Yeah. Yeah, so it's synthetic aperture, aperture radar. Uh, basically, uh, when we take a picture with our camera, we can see features, we can see the boat, we can see whatever we are taking picture of. Synthetic aperture array takes pictures of, uh, it's a beam of light that is reflected and the satellite uh, sensors detected. So for example, a ship would appear like a point source, like an illuminous point, uh, point in the middle of the ocean. So it would be like taking picture, but in black and white. And we would superimpose AIS data. And uh, for those vessels that have turned off their AIS data, we can still see it. So I think that's what we want to try. Maybe, maybe Rafaela, you can add on. Yeah, uh, so this is exactly the innovation the project is bringing. So it's not just AIS and VMS, but radar data. Because as I was saying this morning, radar 
will ever take an image. And doesn't matter what the fishing vessel decide to do, the radar will see it, okay? It's a matter of resolution. So it's a matter of the details. So if we have good data, we can see the, the vessels. And this means that by comparison, you see, okay, I see a fishing vessel here in the radar. Why is not transmitting the corresponding AIS or VMS? If it happens once, okay, maybe it's a fault and you're not going to prosecute it and you let it go for that time. But then if you see that is happening a lot of times, okay, let, wait a moment, what's happening here? That's what the project will do. We'll start with the radar and aim at adding more and more space data to make this effort even more successful in this sense. Yeah, maybe, maybe you could just uh, briefly tell our colleagues here the different sources of, of uh, data, the different satellites uh, yeah. which are provided. So, so, yes, so the UK Space Agency is acquiring uh, radar data over the exclusive economic zone every day now. Um, we have a data grant from US Capella Space for $25,000 of data, and they help us uh, in understanding and validating the tool. So it's not going to solve the problem, but you remember this is a research project. So we are testing and trying the solution until we can define what is the final one. We have Japanese Space Agency that also uh, is awarding us 20 data sets per year from the ALUS mission, which is another synthetic aperture radar. And then, of course, we are going to use the data from the Copernicus constellation, which are a free data, so available to everyone. The other ones I mentioned are not free. Some are commercial, some are from specific space agencies, so they normally cover their regions. But what we want to know is really which is the best data set, which is the best radar. Let's try with everything. And then at the end of the project, what we'll do is design, okay, for Mauritius, what is going to work? Shall we work with Capella data? Shall we work with Sentinel? We try all of them. And then we define a sort of basic solution, lay, middle layer solution and top level. And then we would like to speak to authors and say, can you access this data? Can you access it? Because AIS and VMS will not be sufficient. So we need to have proper conversation with authorities and space agency to make this happen. For now, here's the validation part. Yeah, we have. Will your project be able to determine vessels which are not made from metal, such as Iranian do, if they come in our territorial waters? Okay. The uh, ship detection is a very, very difficult problem. Thank you. Um, we know that uh, the more we evolve with the technology, the more also criminals evolve. Um, we have looked into other detection techniques. We have for now looked into Go fast boats, for example, which are made with fiberglass, very flat, done on a purpose to avoid exactly the detection of radar. For example, this one is a case of a boat sailing at a very fast speed, which means it's leaving a very clear wake behind it. And we have moved our strategy from a ship detection to a wake detection. We cannot cover in this project all cases, but this is the stepping stones for any other solution situation. Hi, it's mainly for Rafala. Is the project is going to take into consideration the thermal emission by the engine? Because if you are traveling at high speed, the engine will be generating a lot of, lot of heat. Are you going to use uh, thermal data from satellites? Thermal data is a very new thing. As I uh, said this morning, uh, it's not even... It's not even been launched. Um, those of you working in remote sensing may know that thermal data historically presented very low resolution. So things that are not going to be helpful in a ship detection. 
we have a partner in the UK that is called Satellite View, and they are now prototype a new thermal sensor, which can now, from space, look at the scene with a three meter resolution or above, okay? We have conducted with Max some preliminary study for them to see what kind of information was giving them, was giving us, and we think they are going to help with the classification of the vessels. However, they are going to be launched and then we'll go to a commissioning phase. So the idea is to use thermal data to support the classification of the vessel, which is our next challenge because detection, we are quite good at that. But what we need to improve is in the ability to say, is this an oil tanker? Is a fishing vessel? What is that? Because I measure the IS is not just the fishing vessels. So we need also to make this classification. So thermal data within the project will be used for classification purposes only for the time being. Right. Yes. Um, I would like, sorry, me again. <laughs> Um, I would like to know if a project is going to bridge the gap um, between, like, for instance, the last AIS signal and when they switch off the next time it switches it on. Yeah, so building pattern. Yes, yeah, yes. The gap. Yes, so it depends very much, which is the reason of this conversation today on the availability we will have of AIS and VMS, because to do this kind of things, you need to have data along some time and different areas so in order to build the patterns. Yes, that's the idea of what we could do. Yeah, we have one question here. Yes, uh, most of the solution that you are talking about AIS, AIS as is, is Oxia, uh, motion is a, it talks about terrestrial AIS. And if I'm not mistaken, my friend Ganesh will uh, uh, confirm this. It's, it works on VHF, so it's very limited in range. If you need satellite AIS, then the means cost. All the other uh, uh, system that they are talking about involves satellite, satellite airtime, and that's a cost. Is this uh, uh, project going to address this? Because this is one of the most important, it's the cost, because we don't have those satellites and it's very costly. Spot on. So, yeah, Rafaela. <laughs> Uh, we we are uh, very aware of this. So thanks so much for the question. Um, you know that the United Nations are very, very uh, keen on making the project scalable, which means we need to prove that works and we need also to go to other geographical regions, Seychelles, Maldives, or whatever the illegal fishing is a, is a problem. So because of the conversation we're having, we do know the cost of the single data set. Uh, what we need to understand is the cost of a service, which means when you subscribe to a data provider, and you're not just purchasing one single data set, but you're asking to have small data set per day or per month, what is going to be the cost? Um, this is a part of the discussion we will have with the different data providers. So you have seen in one of my slides today that many of these uh, in kind partners are supporting us for now with free data. This is because they are happy to be considered partners in this project and discuss with Mauritius this potential service. The cost at the moment is something we have not uh, an idea of simply because we don't know yet the technological solution that is the successful one. We will try a couple of things, but which is the one successful for is something we will know in a year time or so. At that point in time, what we will do is really identify sort of basic module, medium value, um, level and top level classification and detection, and we will pass the cost of this solution to authorities. This means cost in, in many, in many sense it can be you don't build anything yourself, you don't have your constellation, but you rely on other data providers, or what the cost would be if Mauritius decide to 
to have a space agenda, a space agency, and their own constellation. So we will look into all these different aspects as well. Yeah, we can take this question. Uh, it's a practical question. Can we eventually, based on satellite data, uh, do some enforcement? Maybe, uh, Coast Guard, your, your thoughts, Captain? Uh, we've seen that uh, with the AIS system, uh, the local one that is based in Mauritius is only a VHF base. So it does not cover that much distance, maybe some 30, 40 nautical miles, right? And uh, all the information are received locally in the NCG Ops room. So it does not cover the EZ, yeah? But uh, AIS which is based on satellite, of course, whenever the ship is transmitting, so this can be picked up. But so law allows. This. But it is different. It is very difficult then. Outside uh, in the EZ, then it is difficult to make cases because they, sometimes they are on the uh, innocent passage. They mm -hmm. don't come to Mauritius to the port. They just pass going through. So when it is difficult for monitoring or for prosecution also. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Any yeah, other comments? Yeah. Um, by law, in fact, yes. Um, the merchant authorities are authorized to board a vessel and ask for its licenses and and even um, what we are doing um, in the merchant EZ. So yes, um, there are also regional programs with within the Indian Ocean Commission, whereby um, they, for instance, um, Madagascar has got a patrol vessel um, that under the authority of the Indian Ocean Commission can come and patrol um, the, the EZ of the Indian Ocean countries. Uh, the member countries. Um, and yes, there have been examples of boarding at sea and uh, seizing vessels uh, with illegal fishing. Um, quite a number of examples. Right. Um, let's say I have a, a question. Let's say this project uh, we uh, define, we, we are successful in finding an algorithm that uh, provides us near real time footprint of the fishing vessels. How, in your opinion, and, and this is brainstorming, do you think we should go about to get governments buy in for this type of, of tool? And this is an open question and we can discuss. Yes, Mata. Well, I think there, this is a sector for some is considered as a sector having lots of issue with regards to economic development and maybe confidentiality. So how about uh, considering at least uh, getting an agreement with uh, key stakeholders first before we, we try to aim too high? Any other comments on this? Yes. So I would like to make a general comment, uh, being myself uh, in uh, education at the university, I believe maybe to get people to uh, understand the importance of sharing is education. Maybe once each sector realizes how what uh, that particular sector has to gain from the other, maybe uh, they might be more ready for sharing. Uh, it's an opinion. I feel education is also important. Right, madam. Um, listening to the minister's speech this morning, um, I think he, he already mentioned of an initiative and the tests at the moment at the Ministry of Fisheries. And so I think that the, the government shows real interest in that sector. Mm. So, um, I mean, uh, 
I just listened to his speech this morning. I'm sure that there are other officers from Ministry of Fisheries that might want to, to share more on that. Any, any other thoughts? I think a total different uh, analogy, but you know, uh, some of the uh, best, uh, I'm mean, talking from my IT security point of view, some of the best uh, uh, security solutions are designed by people who are either hackers or they were white hat hackers, as we say that. I think maybe, maybe the guns who, who are into this practice of, you know, beating the, you know, they will always be ahead of the curve. Let's accept it, you know, because we need to close all the doors and they just need one opening. So the odds are stacked against when you are, when you are in the, in the catching mode and somebody is in the evading mode, I think maybe some, some way of getting, you know, these ex guys to, to share their best practices and leapfrog our our this thing because they are ahead of the curve. They know uh, when you you, you can uh, start measuring the waves. Uh, maybe they know how to ditch that. You know, uh, the, the, maybe the, the design of the boat itself is changing. So the insights we get. I mean, it's it's it looks a little bit paradoxical, but the insights that we get from people who have already breached the law is 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 priceless because. They have done it, and they are ahead of the curve. So maybe I mean. No, interesting. Uh, is 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 there anybody from from this room who can talk about the way we provide uh, the licenses to fishing vessels? How is any anyone comment? Again, not my section, but I can introduce the topic to the audience here. So how the ministry issues license is any fishing operator, let's say Mr. X comes to the ministry with an intention to do business with their vessel. So they will provide information, first of all, about their fishing vessel and the type of fishery that they want to go into. The ministry on their end will do their due diligence with the operator that has come for business and the vessel. So we, the, the ministry has a licensing unit that goes through the documentation of the vessel and we use the, uh, the radio call sign to track the vessel, track the, uh, the owners of the vessel and see if they have any links to blacklisted uh, vessels or blacklisted events. This determines whether they will be allowed a license or not. The ministry has the option of not issuing the license altogether to this uh, fishing vessel. So if all is in the clear, then they will issue a license against a fee, of course, and there will be set conditions that the operator has to uh, follow for uh, uh, the license being issued. I think it's, it's very general, but that's the general idea that uh, you may have. Any other comments? Yeah. I would like to know whether uh, the ministry asks for uh, uh... blue economy. No. Uh, question of uh, insurance kind of uh, do they provide uh, uh, they are required to have an insurance to cover a certain amount of liability because we've seen in several cases recently uh, when a problem arises, it falls on either the Mexico or shipping or the coast guard or some other and those people they don't foot the bill yeah, when we do due diligence uh, with paperwork from the fishing business itself, it should have seaworthiness and insurance uh, provided by the fishing operator already. And we should be uh, certified as what we require as well. My question is, uh, I've been uh, listening to you all. So why they are not uh, someone from the Ministry of, of Fisheries and from Ports Authorities? Because I've seen that 
uh, practically all the stakeholders are here, but uh, two, when I'm listening, there are two, you are uh, uh, you are replying for the Ministry of, of Fisheries, and then there's no one from Port Authorities because of, yeah. <laughs> no. I, think, I think both stakeholders are here. Uh, Ministry of uh, Blue Economy and maybe Port Authority, you would like to, to uh, give us your thoughts? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, uh, in this uh, respect, uh, I've been listening to all the, the stakeholders and the proposal of this uh, project. I, at the port level, uh, there's not much of uh, control as such. The main thing is with the uh, fishing uh, authorities, which they issue the license. At port level, we control the entries depending when they're submitting their notice of arrival and all the uh, documentation. Presently, all the fishing vessel, whether it is local, uh, mainly the foreign uh, registered vessel, we do process the uh, arrival uh, clearances in such a way that uh, we we uh, control all the paperwork at the uh, level of uh, certification, safety, seaworthiness, fishing license, and the insurance. But uh, to tell you, frankly, a lot of these Taiwanese vessel, when they submit their papers, they're all uh, photocopies. There's not much uh, we can do. We can uh, check on the the uh, whether the people are genuine or not. We have cases like uh, recently you have cases where these fishing vessels, when they come and when they go aground, it's at that time that we find out that the uh, the insurance, whether it is fake, and there's a lot of delays for for them to I mean to intervene. Even the PNI club also there's a lot of delays on their side to in, uh, to inter to take action, proper action. And then at the end of the day, we see that the Mauritian government is paying a, the, I mean, uh, the bill and we have to claim back, but it, it's a long process for claiming back this uh, money. Any other question I can reply with? Yes. <laughs> uh, you're talking about checking our papers. Uh, does uh, uh, shipping checks uh, uh, the, the passage? Uh, 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 the new jobs. Do you check what they come in for, whether they are up to the charge of the area that they are, they are covering? Because we've seen them going around near Port Louis, going around in St. Brandon. Do they have up to the charge? No, this is a mainly a question of for the shipping division. If we, if we do suspect any deficiencies on, the, on board this vessel, we do report it back to the shipping division where they have inspectors who come on board to check the paperwork and the certification as such. Because prior arriving, the, they are supposed to be submitting all the certification to the shipping division. This is uh, on the port side, this is an over and above checking that we are doing the certification as such. All right. So I will just prompt one. Do you, anybody wants to intervene? No? One last question before we end this. Yeah, I think uh, our colleague from ICTA, yeah? Yes, uh, I would like to just to highlight from the ICTA point of view that uh, operation of maritime radio equipment on board uh, vessels uh, registered under the motion flag uh, needs a ship station license from the authority. And whenever we have we receive applications for the ship station license, we provide the static uh, AIS information, that is the call sign and the MMSI. And then we are certain that these radios have been uh, programmed by obtaining a programming certificate. And we do perform inspections on both the vessels as well. And then once they get the required license, they are, they are able to operate. So this is for, with regard to the static AIS information. Thank you. One last question to, to cover about the uh, illegal unreported uh, fishing. We have the question in, in this question. There, there were the three groups merged, so that's why I'm sort of taking some of the basic questions. Are there any national estimates of the economic impact of IUU for Mauritius? Any anybody can answer? No. According to Mr. Boabia, what we saw, it's not that clear or that significant? Yes. What I know is recently the IOC has worked with UNECA uh, to do a study in the region, not only in Mauritius, 
in the region and uh, on different type of illegal activities and what is the economic impact. Uh, the document is ready. It's about to be launched uh, recently and you will have a uh, lot of information in that. Okay. It's not uh, only to Mauritius, but to the whole uh, Western Indian Ocean region and it covers uh, IU in that. Right. That it's, be... it's just to be launched. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, Rafaela, would you like uh, to say a few words to conclude and then I'll invite our colleagues, rapporteurs, to uh, share the, a summary of uh, all this discussion. There was also another uh, group on the gender aspect. Thank you very much, uh, Vikas, uh, for your support. And uh, so we'll, uh, yeah, we have one. Uh, um, is there anybody from Continental Shelf? Yes, there are two ladies here. Oh, okay. <laughs> you would like? No, no, okay. I just wanted to know where they are. Okay. Uh, yeah, Rafael. <laughs> Thank you, Vikram. Um, first of all, thanks very much for coming to this workshop today. Um, I, as a person working on space application, I know how fundamental he is speaking with the people that uh, should benefit from the application. So I know that if we don't do this, this way is going to go in the, in the wrong direction. All the things you said have been recorded safely and will be used. And I really hope I can come back to you um, so I do have business cards. I would really, really like you to come and speak to me. I understand that this is not common in Mauritius or by Mauritius people to approach others. And if it's because of culture, you're shy, uh, but I'm, I'm not, I hope I'm not scaring people, uh, really trying to do something for you. Um, so do please come and have a chat with me, take my business card, because what would be really useful for me, for Max and for Vikram and everyone working on the project is to continue this conversation. Okay, we do hope we can even come back at the end of the project to say, look, this is what we did. Um, but I think it's going to be fruitful if this conversation will stay as it is during the next months and the next weeks, as I'm sure there are questions we didn't have time to address. And uh, understanding what your opinion is would be really, really useful for, for me and for us all. Uh, so yes, please do come, have a chat, take a business card, write to me, link on LinkedIn with me, Mike, so whoever you think is useful or you can speak with and thanks again for this great day. Thank you, Rafaela. So um, before I ask my colleagues, reporters to come in, anybody wants to share sort of a quick one minute sort of uh, opinion or what things that we have not covered in the discussions? Please, uh, Vikas, then uh, Inspector. Yeah. Look, yeah, so I think, uh, uh, Dr. Vishudhar, I think uh, MRIC has done a good job because uh, someone like me who had uh, not much idea about this domain, I think getting, uh, we, we do understand connectivity, satellites, and all those things, but not this domain. I think it's a fantastic uh, initiative where um, a lot of experts from a lot of domains can at least uh, peacefully listen to uh, diversified opinions and, and appreciate, uh, maybe sometime agree, sometime agree to disagree, and, and, and take away some really good thoughts while we go back to our work, at least it thought provoking as a new idea and definitely quite interesting. Thank you for this. Thanks, thanks, Vikas. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. thank you. Uh, uh, first thing is, uh, I think I have two points. The one is uh, we have been talking about uh, the system, and uh, later on we talk about uh, enforcing. I think it's important that we have the legal uh, representative also, uh, so that at least uh, there was a debate on whether we can. Uh, how uh, this space, the uh, data to be ad admissible in court. Uh, we have seen, you know, all this goes with evolution and definitely uh, I think it is uh, uh, an avenue which can be expl exploited. Uh, secondly is uh, presently as I'm talking to you, we do have one system uh, which is known as a skylight. I think it is used by MRA 
Coast Guard, and we also use it in, in the region. Uh, it's a system that has been developed by uh, Volcan INC, a US uh, base, but it is sponsored by UNODC and being given to, to the region. So how different uh, uh, the new system is compared to Skylight? Because Skylight is a system which uh, basically monitor uh, the rendezvous uh, between the vessel, uh, suspected uh, uh, transshipment, and, and so on. We have been using it uh, for the last one and a half year. And uh, there has been a lot of uh, input that uh, the uh, administrator or those who have derived the system to improve the system. So how different is it? And even the minister mentioned about, the honorable minister mentioned about one system that was recently launched in, in Thailand, space uh, something which I missed uh, the name. So uh, we should avoid uh, uh, the multiplicity of system because uh, imagine the operator sitting in an ops room. He has got five systems and uh, he might not uh, give due diligence to even one system and uh, we might miss uh, out of it and and this is a difficulty that uh, practical difficulties that we have seen uh, in the region thank you Rafaela, would you like to comment um, yeah that is one but there are a few more um sort of platforms being used today for vessel monitoring or specifically for fishing vessel monitoring. Uh, we have at the moment a limited knowledge of what they do because the majority of information we get is from website or as a researcher myself, what we look into is really papers and scientific papers. What we know is the main difference is the fact that our work is heavily based on radar data and the new upcoming satellite missions. That's the main things. The majority of this platform and system do all work or are based on AES, VMS. A few are trying to start using radar data, um, but radar data is a very, very quite new technology, um, which is very difficult to find as something uh, the university master. Um, so I believe that is going to be the turning point of the system particular, but uh, it's uh, a requisite for, for us to make sure that, as you said, we do not reinvent the wheel, we do not replicate or duplicate efforts in an area. So this is something we'll look into. Thank you. And uh, so before I close, I wish uh, also to uh, uh, welcome and, and, and um, hear the participation of uh, some uh, uh, secondary school students from Lycée de Mascari. Thank you for coming. Uh, I know for you it might seem very high level, but I think it's uh, never too late or too young to get involved. So this is our future generation. This is why we invited you so that you can get to mix already with uh, these types of people. This is a new uh, field that the MRIC would like to, to launch. So we, we count on you guys. So I think uh, let's uh, have some 10 minutes thought, a, a summary of the thoughts. My colleagues, the reporters will be coming and uh, give you what uh, they, they have captured. So there are, well, two groups. One, this group, uh, sort of regroup the groups, uh, topics one, two, and three. And uh, thank you, Vikas. And uh, uh, the other one, the fourth one was on gender. So, Paul? So, for, for breakout session one, uh, VMS and AIS data, the first question was, how does the Ministry of Blue Economy determine suspicious activity from VMS data? So from the responses we obtained from the crowd, uh, data from ships are sent to authorities and uh, operators have terms and conditions that they should abide to. So these data are observed by the Arden Fisheries and as well National Coast Guard and any, and any unusual behavior have to be justified. Otherwise, sections are, sanctions are applied. Those data are interpreted based on past events and incidents being observed. Those issues are flagged and the Arduin fisheries will make the NCG aware of them. Uh, 
the National Coast Guard makes use of AIS data and categorize different movements or suspicious behavior. National Coast Guard can also communicate with vessel for inquiry, depending on AIS information received. There was a question on what types of activities are classified as suspicious. So if a vessel is not fishing in a specified region, that's qualified as suspicious. And if they are going in unusual areas, which are not supposed to, that's also flagged as suspicious activities. Uh, so VMS and AIS data are the two main set of regulations, two main set of VMS and AIS regulations are there, and sanctions are applied if regulations are not respected. VMS data are centralized to the Albion, and the National Coast Guard has a platform to retrieve AIS data. And it was also mentioned there are two types of AIS data. There's C-Vision, uh, which is based on satellite AIS, and there's coastal AIS also, which is also used. It was also mentioned that vessels have to notify NCG when they enter or leave the EEZ. And uh, it was also mentioned that uh, data has to be made public and using big data and predictive analysis, uh, we can use masking technology as well to identify trends and detect suspicious activities. And then the next question, what is the current monitoring coverage of the motion EZ with AIS VMS? Does the terrestrial AIS network on Mercer's coverage anti-EZ, any other data sources in use such as SST and chlorophyll A. Uh, so the representative from Albion Fishes already explained the nautical mice from the shorelines for the limitation of the EZ and so on. And uh, It was mentioned that there's 5,000 ships per day crossing the Indian Ocean, and AIS is not 100% proof. We can only, we can at most modify uh, only 70% 70, 70 of the ships uh, going uh, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, also, countries do not share info on number of VMS uh, license issued, so th that could pose a problem because we need those data for proper monitoring and detection. So AIS data, VMS data can be fed into a model to identify a pattern. And one innovative techniques which is going to be used include SAR data, synthetic aperture radar data. And we superimpose AIS and VMS data on the SAR data to identify trends. And there was a question, what if uh, vessels switch off the AIS or VMS data? Uh, VMS uh, data. So it doesn't matter what the vessel decides to do, SAR will identify it. But then we need AIS and VMS for, uh, we need the AIS for, to identify unusual activities. And we will use class classification detection techniques as well to identify any other unusual activities. Uh, there was a question on thermal data uh, for identifying ships. So thermal sensors can be used for classification and by identifying engine heat and, and so on. There was a question on can authorities board vessels for control purposes based on space derived data? Uh, one, one member informed that yes, there are a few examples, including IU fishing, where uh, authorities have used space data to, to board uh, vessels for unusual activities. And uh, I also there was 
someone suggested that we could gather insight from people who have breached the law, who were previous, uh, previously involved in IUU fishing. So it is being mentioned that they are ahead of the curve, so they could provide provide insights on what could be done to to what could be the next move of, of uh, those who wants to breach the law and and use those uh, insight to make better models. Uh, representative from ICTA mentioned about IC, static AIS uh, data and how the processing the, the process is carried out to issue the the call sign and, and so on for for ships and to give them the license. Okay, that's all for from from my side. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you. Uh, let me call upon our colleagues from the gender uh, discussion group uh, to share the their thoughts. Hello, everyone. So for topic four, we were discussing on the gender analysis in the context of fishing. We had a small group of participants who shared uh, some great insights. So the first question was on the main gender related issues in the context of fishing. And the answers were as follows. So firstly, our report simply um, shared that the fishing sector is a male dominated sector and uh, also the purchase of materials for fishing is more accessible to men rather than women and the women are underrepresented and un unpaid in the sector in the fishing sector which makes it less accessible for them to enter the sector um, the women do not have that uh, push factor, they lack support, they lack a support system in terms of mentoring and coaching to guide them to enter the fishery market. Sorry. Also in Mauritius, there is that cultural component that hinders the opportunities for women in fishery sector. The regions, for example, urban region or rural region have different um, ideas over the fact that women should be in the fishery sector or not. Um, the second question was on whether underrepresentation of women affect their abilities to influence policies, and uh, our participant agreed. And they, propo they, they proposed some solution. For example, they said that inviting fishermen, fisherwomen to this kind of workshop will allow policymakers to have a true picture. For example, if today, if if able, if we were able to invite some fisherwomen, we would be able to get their idea and their um, day to day life. We would be able to talk to them more. And so uh, it would have pro provided us with a proper picture and a true picture. And also proper training should be given to women, for example, life saving courses and swimming courses for them to for the, for, uh, the, it will facilitate them to enter in the fishing fishing sector. Sorry. Um, next question is under representation affecting the support women get? Uh, compared to fishermen, yes, obviously, their voices are not heard. And as a solution, the policymakers should consist of women who will be able to empathize with fisherwomen. Next question. Do women get same compensation as men in case of environmental disaster? No, the disparity is there. Maybe the women do not even know that there is an association or a unit working for them to help them, and maybe they are not even registered. So there should be like a, an ecosystem whereby everyone help the, the, each other to make them aware and to make, to sensitize them of the services that are there. So fisher women are able to get compensated just like the that just like men. Again, when asked whether fisher women get the same salary as men, uh, our participant 
were reluctant and uh, obviously uh, we do not agree. They said that they do not get the salary as men, as women take maternity leaves or leaves to look after children, therefore the salary will not be the same because women will have to spend more time at home than men, so they will not be able to catch more uh, fish uh, compared to men. So the salary will not be the same. Um, also, people have the pers perception that women will take more hours to get the work done rather than men. When it comes to the fishing industry and the fishing sector, uh, fishing takes a lot of physical effort. To, so we think that women will not get the same kind of salary because they will not be able to put the same kind of efforts. So that is why they are not compensated or get the same salary. Next, in which areas are women most involved with? Uh, so we, we, we thought about that and we, were, we agreed that women are more into the processing and packaging area rather than being out in the ocean. Next question was, how can we involve the women fishing community to ensure that they have their say? And the answers were as follows. Organizing more stakeholders community at community level, meet with stakeholders coming from the same background and region. Then there's a need to have to be at the grassroots le level, that is the, the awareness session that we can conduct should be, um, should highlight the grassroots problems, involve fisherwomen in workshop, as I said before, there should be training for fisher fisherwomen, Mauritian women are already helping their husband in all aspects, therefore they are able to help their husband in the fishing industry as well. So that was a little bit about what we said. Uh, lastly, one last question. How can we reach out to the gender focal points in the areas of fisheries in Mauritius? The Ministry of Gender Equality is currently working with the gender cell to address this, these disparities. However, the action plan should be vigorous enough to be able to answer the questions of fishers, especially women. The gender focal points should be able to facilitate all procedures, paperwork, as it takes a lot of time for both women and men. So these were um, the brainstorming session that we did. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I think they did a, a fantastic job. So we've come to the end of uh, this uh, working session workshop on behalf of the Mauritius Research and Innovation Council I wish to thank you very much or each and every one of you for having come here having spent a day and having actively participated um, to this workshop I think uh, uh, without the help of my colleagues uh, uh, there, there are many of them uh, my senior colleagues, uh, you will recognize yourselves. Thank you very much. And, um, I, and I wish to thank you all. And we close this session today. Should you have any questions, anything, you can please feel free to, to contact me or even Rafaela. Um, Rafaela, would you like to say one word? Okay, to last, uh, to last, uh, things. My business cards are here, so feel free to pick one. Um, I'm available tomorrow morning to have a two more different institutions. There was a plan we had uh, uh, drafted a few days ago, uh, which I will leave also here for you to check. And if you think it's still possible to come and visit your institutions, I really, really would like to do so. Uh, if there is a need to come for the visit, just let me know and it will be, be fine. And yep. the very last thing is, it was mentioned that we're organizing a building capacity problem with staff very soon. If you think, whatever the age, whatever the educational level, that you would like to be involved in any part, then we feel that the people in your institution should need to be trained on the use of satellite data, space, or the funnel to please let me come or myself know as we will prepare very soon the list of delegates or people Thank you very much. So a big hand of applause to ourselves and see you all soon. Bye.